colleagues for um, our discussion on APFO Council Bills 1 and 2. Um, we heard uh, the other night, what, I, or what I'd like to do as a result of the other night is to talk about the new information that came our way, all right? And I'd like to, in my head, I've divided it into two major parts. In your heads, you may have divided it into many more parts, but we're going to go with what's in my head, and then we can subdivide what's in my head, okay? And so That's I... A we, giant hold on, we may need to add on to so what's in your head. You're assuming that it's all covered by what's in your head. It could well be. <laughs> it could. It just may not come out of my mouth, all right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I am thinking that we will talk about the fiscal impact that was brought to us and the new information that was brought to us, and then we will talk about affordable housing. So along those lines, we're going to start with um, Mr. Tweel and EDA and their... Um, the study that they provided us, and we will go from there. Mr. Fox, you are just waiting to say I, I something. Just, uh, the, the choice of the word subdivided also is a little <laughs> off. <laughs> well, Based I'm known, off of where we're at. <laughs> I am so known for using those words that are inappropriate. So, Mr. Cook? Mr. Cook? Okay. No, I'm not ignoring you. Yes, I am. I am so ignoring you. I was going to suggest to Mr. Cook that he could just move that blue chair and slide around the corner, then you could actually see the presentation. Mr. Glenn Denning is going to have to look here, backwards Cook, with his eyes. Like to, <laughs> there's room down here as well if you feel more comfortable right. sitting with us as opposed to with the testimony people. Or, yes, I know Mr. Fox is here too, but. For those folks who've entered the room in the midst of us trying to get ready to start next, what we are going to do on our FO discussion is to begin with the fiscal analysis that was prepared by EDA. Um, which raises raise some questions for us. From there, we will move on to other questions that have been raised, um, other fiscal questions that have been raised, and then we will go into um, a discussion of affordable housing. So, Mr. Tweel, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's your turn. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Council members, what I think I'd like to do, it looks like there's going to be a presentation. If you see something that you would like to ask a question on, um, so Mr. Tweel, Mr. Clinch, and Mr. Steer, um, I'm going to ask my colleagues to not necessarily hold their questions, but because this, we want this to be a discussion, a free-flowing, um, folks, you can, um, as long as we're polite, I'll, I'll step back and you can simply ask a question if we, if, all right. If I have to clamp down, I will. Just some logistical issues. So this is Certainly. this looks like 15 pages of relatively dense information. One, do we have this electronically? Because I'm sure a lot of our residents are going to be quite interested and in maybe following. So they can follow. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And two, I don't know how efficiently you planned on moving through this, but um, I'm going to leave it at that. We're good. So we can, do we have it we can certainly uh, get you th uh, this this copy. It really is it? Uh, the the talking points that are in in the reports of the information is 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 consistent. It was really just meant to guide the conversation uh, quickly. But we do appreciate the opportunity to come to the work session and uh, more fully explain um, the, uh, the the impacts and probably the caveats uh, as well. Um, as it relates to the as it relates to the study. So just um, to clarify, are you able to send that to us now? So, to I mean, because there's folks right now who would I like will to be able to follow. Send along. it to Ms. Philbert. Yeah, and then we could could give me a moment because we could get it absolutely posted. posted. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll finish my uh, introductory comments, and then turn it over to uh, to the gentleman to to explain the numbers, and I'll get it over to uh, to Ms. Feldmar. Um, but we do appreciate the. Uh, the opportunity to more fully explain uh, uh, the, the report. Um, you know, we, uh, we commissioned the study. It was probably just before Thanksgiving, so the information was uh, up to these gentlemen to uh, consolidate, and we really did work uh, 
quite uh, diligently to get it out as soon as possible and have it part of the public record, but we do appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, dig into the, uh, the numbers and take more questions because it's difficult to explain a study of, of this uh, Im importance uh, in, a, in a short three-minute uh, testimony. So thank you for inviting us back. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, uh, to Dr. Clinch and Mr. Steer to uh, uh, talk more fully about the, uh, the fiscal and economic impacts at this, at this time. Sure. Larry asked that we pr make a brief presentation just kind of so you could walk you through the report. So uh, what we did were two studies, a an economic impact analysis, which I directed, and a fiscal impact analysis, which Ed Steer directed. The economic impact analysis looks at the issues of what are the foregone construction activity, uh, what does that mean on the county, so less development equals less construction activity which impacts the local economy, what's the foregone residential development meaning we have less residents moving into the county which has a fiscal and economic impact, I used the in-plan input-output model. Uh, Ed looked at the more detailed way at the fiscals of what this means, kind of doing a cost-benefit analysis of what the, the key revenues and expenditures associated with these populations would be. Um, the data inputs were basically the planned construction units, and this is from page 7 of the report which we provided. Um, you know, APFO limits development in 80 to 90 percent of the county, which would have a bigger impact on units because the areas that are open have less density. Uh, so we estimated the number of impacted units with data provided by the planning department. We then used that to, to estimate the economic and fiscal impacts. So this was really driven by data also provided by the planning department on new home sales. So the, we used the sales price from new homes to estimate the construction costs associated with these planned units because we don't know what the construction costs will be in the future, so we used what's going on now as a model, again, by region, by planning district, by type of home. Uh, I won't go into the assumptions unless people are interested. And again, this is pages two and three in the report. If people have questions, I'll go over it for sake of brevity. So the economic impact analysis is, is, was pretty ba very simple. Uh, if you have reduced development activity of about uh, 6,800 units, uh, you have reduced construction activity, uh, you have reduced resident incomes to people who would have occupied those homes, and that has impacts on the county's economy in terms of a reduction in economic activity, reduction in jobs, uh, and an impact on county revenues. And that's what we estimated using the in-plan model. Before we move on, okay, I guess this is a, a fundamental point, the 6854, since it's a variable, primary variable in all your calculations. All right, so that number, it's not 80 or 90 percent of, of the expected development as the, the expected uh, impact was uh, limits were 80 to 90 percent. So it would be, we don't really have a way of getting it to the exact units because of the density issues, but I guess right. we, we modeled it on all units. All units. So, and it's a scalable of, model. So if it was 50 percent, the model would be roughly 50 percent. Okay. So, and so that 6854 is based on the max number of units that could be built in a, con, in a given year. The planned number of units. Planned number of units. That based, could based have been built in those plan. years. And it would be somewhere between, you know, 90% and that number, realistically. Right. Okay. And then, um, and I know there were some numbers in the, in the report that looked historically back the last six years. The average is about 1450 or 1460. About 17 on page. That, we didn't have that on here, but it's on page... Page, excuse me, page 13. Oh, you're at 1,400 with 1,600, 1,700 in the last couple of years. So Right. No, I just looked at the Sorry. average of the last six years. And that, that's inclusive of a, a reentry out of a, a recession. I'm sorry. Could you, what, what was that again? Say so that it's again? what, yeah. Let's look at the page number. We lo really looked at what happened over since 2011. And, you know, the, the, so the average was 1,400, but in the last uh, three years, it's been between 16 and 1,800. So no, no sensitivity was done to determine like the why that that happened the spike in the last couple of years versus the the lower numbers in the in the previous three or four years in the in the period the six year period. No, we based it on data from on what okay. the plan was for the okay. county. All right, that, that, that's 
fine. So that number is based on what was in the plan. Correct. Okay. Just Can I ask Mr. Mr. Burnell just a question? Could you help help us understand? You know, you know, from that perspective, I figured you'd be a good one to. So as, as far as the historic, I, um, I think I presented this chart before. This is actual building permits, and it's, it's, uh, it's aligned with what's been said. It's, um, if you look at since 2010, the average was 1,744 units per year, so an average of about 1,700 units per year. And there are spikes that was referenced uh, for a few years. And that the, the reason that we have those spikes every once in a while is because of large apartment buildings that get built. So, but the average since 2010, so 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 up through September is 1744 units per year. So, wh which projects caused? I'm looking here. Thanks for putting this online here. Is the uh, 20, actually, the 2013 and 2016 spikes? What projects caused those? Um, I think in 16, it might have been uh, Annapolis Junction, 416 units. There's a project called the, the Vine, or the, the BUC8 boot, boot property off of 29 was another few hundred. Might include downtown Columbia. So I don't recall exactly, but that some, some, I do know that this, the Annapolis Junction is 2016 at 400 units. So there's three or four projects like that. And then downtown Columbia, we have uh, the Metropolitan was probably in the 2013 year. Gotcha. Yeah. So your number is based on permits, not on construction of units. Um, that's correct. Those are okay. permits. So because in the report yeah. on page 13, that's the construction unit. Uh, that's the discrepancy then. And, and oh, that you're 1,744 yeah, right. versus the actual. Yeah. Constructed units, which, oh. which from 11. So I don't, I don't know the number. There's no numbers for 2010 in here, but that's where the 1484 average, six-year average for new unit construction is. Okay, yeah, that would explain it because there's a lag between the building permits and the, the, the natural construction. I was going to exactly. then also say right. from the other yeah. point, I guess, from the starting period to get to the permits, how many years was that to get and most of those to get to the permits? Uh, you mean? terms of when the plan is submitted yeah or from when they or, th things got started or well it, it all it varies quite range it, it, well we probably three years on average so by the time that that a plan is submitted and and the time that they the units are built is about three years typically for a small subdivision it could be a year submitted and or built or submitted and permitted submitted and then permitted and then built also. So that would include construction time. So typical construction from, from initial plan submission to units built on the ground is typically three years. That's kind of the way APFA was designed. Okay, right. Yeah. So most yeah. of this stuff is from stuff from our first two, from our first two terms, not things that we've approved recently, not, not from changes, not anything we've done. Yeah, I mean, you could you could probably you know anything three years. It takes about three years to build something. So. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So basically, we use the estimated construction values uh, to estimate the construction impacts. The resident estimated uh, sales price of the units to estimate what the incomes of the households occupying them would be, and then estimated the economic impacts of what that would be. So just from the construction side, so again, we're going to be two streams of impacts on the county's economy. On the construction side, you'll lose between something approaching $500 million a year in construction activity, which will cost on average per year about $750 million in economic activity, and you have 4,600 jobs. Slide on the right just shows that as a, as a graphical. Uh, in terms of understanding the magnitude of the impacts on the county, Construction jobs today account for about 6% of county's uh, employment base based on DEA data. Uh, the 2,800 direct construction jobs, these, these uh, economic impact numbers, the 46, the larger numbers include the economic multiplier effects. Uh, the 2,800 direct construction jobs on average would account for 19-20% of employment per year in the construction sector in the county. In terms of the res residential impacts, if we have less units, we have less people moving into the county. As a result, the county will have less spending and less revenue. You'll have about $170 million a year in lost revenue or uh, resident incomes, 
which translate to about 150 million, I'm rounding all these numbers just for you know, the sake of brevity, which would grow cumulatively. So if you're building you know, 1,700 less units in year one, you have 3,400 un less units year two, so it grows cumulatively to about $750 million, which, with about a $600 million impact, 3,800 jobs, and an estimated, again, based on the in-plan model, estimated county revenue loss potential of $32 million. This is simply taking those job impacts and you know, taking them up, showing them cumulatively with the construction and residential income reductions cumulatively. This is just the job losses. So in 2025, the loss of job potential could be as high as 8,300 jobs. So I'll now pass is it Is this over cumulative as well? This is the re cumulative representation of the, the, the constructions would be year by year impacts. The loss of resident incomes would be growing cumulatively. And this is just adding those two numbers together to show a, a rough order of magnitude of potential job losses. I'll now pass it over to Ed. Oh, re re sorry. Uh, residential income jobs. These are the residents. Two, two sets of the jobs. Earners, the earners that would not come to the county because they can't buy a new home. No, it would be the, the, the blue number is the construction and, and, jo right. and multiplier effect that. jobs. The orange would be we have less people, so we have less jobs at Giant and Antwerp and, and other, you know, movies. So the 4,500 construction jobs are, con are uh, Those a catalyst the, for 3,800 other jobs. Okay. I, I apologize. I, made it, I, I thought I was clarifying it. I made it harder. Uh, there's two streams of impacts, construction mm -hmm. and, oper and, and residential income. The blue is the construction impact. So you lose about 2,800 mm -hmm. construction jobs per year and about, you know, uh, you know 2,500 or 1,500 additional multiplier effect jobs. So jobs at Home Depot, the suppliers, uh, that's the blue number. The orange number is you have less residents. Right. So okay. Less, that's, so, that's what I'd uh, say. Right. I, 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 I didn't. I, I the, re, it's the, the, the orange is the, re, the income from residents that would not be correct to the county. That's, yes. that's what I said. Okay. So, but not the residents themselves. So they, they, you don't know where they're working. So the jobs the, created by the resident spend. But, 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 okay. but along gotcha. those lines, though, the benefit to the county has to do with the residents. You don't, we don't know what the percentage of income that's actually going to stay with Howard County as far as this, the, the income tax associated with those jobs. Which is why we had the second study, so to, to look more at the fiscals. Okay. I, I just want to make sure. So I, I made a rough estimate of that, but the model itself is pretty imprecise on fiscal impacts, so that's why we had a two-part study. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll wait, I guess. I, I yeah, a lot I'm, of sorry, I'm, I'm just going <laughs> to to clarify, so because I believe I understand what you're saying, and I think we're saying the same thing. It's the orange or the jobs generated by new residents. Jobs generated by new residents. In the county. Correct. Right. I apologize. So those are the end up living here, or are those the job or actual jobs? Jobs, jobs? in the county, supported the by county. the people. So, if they were, if, if we had the houses. Well, what, so well, that's the whole. That I mean, right. the reality is, if you have the houses, you're going to whether the jobs are in the county or not. Those houses are going to generate in, in, income, even if they're working in D.C. Versus these jobs may or may not be. There's in the, the tax county. revenue they're, that's they're, generated right. different. Just want to make that's sure. different from what this represents. Yeah, because I guess from my perspective, what I really want to be looking at is impact to the county bottom line. I understand some of these things are important for us to understand, but what I want to understand is the, the bottom line county-wise. Well, this is part of that, which is the, I understand. which is the jobs that we would no longer have in the county if the development would would be allowed. And so the next piece of the study is the fiscal, which is going to account for the revenue and economic impact of those 8,300 jobs. No, of the residents of the you know, 6,800 lost okay, residents. So then, then it goes back to what Mr. Fox is saying, is that this, I'll, I'll, I'll de de defer, I, I, I might need a better sense of the impact of these 8,300 jobs. It's a big number to truly understand those numbers that are obviously, so these are people who are working now uh, at the retail shop down the street because there are more residents in Howard County. Uh, with that impact then, that's not quantified in here, that the impact of that economic activity in the county. In the fiscal analysis in the second part, no, it focuses just on the households okay. itself. Gotcha. Great. Thank you. 
Then the last part of the economic impact study is what are the, you know, other than economic impacts, and we kind of focused on three areas. Economic development impacts, uh, which is really that there's a change in real estate preferences occurring nationally. Uh, both, re both residents and companies are favoring more urban locations uh, and a more dense pattern of development. Uh, it would potentially, if we don't do this type of development, we'll not be having some of the development in downtown Columbia to create this dynamic in the county, and that would hurt economic development, so it would impact downtown development. And then the issue that has, was raised in the hearing in terms of, you know, will we be able to attract employers to come into the county if their workers can't find housing here? Uh, we looked at development process impact. The, the current APFO has, you know, created a clear process and hasn't resulted in these types of restrictions on development countywide in the past. So it's provided, you know, what, what in the APFO uh, reviews that have been done by the Smart Growth Center in Maryland called a consistent and predictable process for Maryland or for the county, and that would obviously be impacted by a, a legislation of this magnitude. And then finally, which I think you're going to be addressing the second part of today's hearing, which is uh, it would impact housing affordability and inclusion. Uh, the impact of, of APFOs and, more importantly, of moratoria have been generally found to increase residential costs in a region, and that has impacts on inclusion and affordability and would also on the generation of MIHUs. So that's addressed in the report very briefly, and I know you're hearing more about it later. So in terms of the economics, that's the part I did. I'll pass it over to Ed if you guys are no more <coughs> questions. We may come back and ask you some, but Mr. Steer. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, glad to be here this evening. So as uh, Dr. Quench pointed out, I looked at the uh, fiscal impact of the, uh, of the what I will refer to repeatedly as foregone construction on the county budget. The, um, as I pointed out last week, it's a high-level analysis. There's the county budget is broken into so many pieces, and some parts of it are funded generally, and some are funded by other sources. Uh, so we'll touch on that a little bit here. But at this first uh, brush at this, what we looked at were the three main sources of general fund revenues, which are property taxes, income taxes, and the obligatory fire and rescue tax, which is actually small, but it's one of those taxes everybody pays. So that makes up 88.8% of the uh, general fund. Um, so it is really the most tangible part of the uh, county revenue stream. And we can break that down by household and per capita. Uh, using the data, the first table on that slide is table 10 and um, from the original report, which shows the, some of the inputs. and. Uh, the computation for the population that's coming from the foregone housing units that we derived with the help of Mr. Braun out here um, <laughs> is the allocations from the county. So uh, what I have there is that the, the household size, the um, median household income, this is all generated by uh, American Fact Finder, uh, American Community. Uh, so the, um, the tax rates are straight out of the Howard County budget. Uh, so moving on to the next one, I don't expect anybody to read that table on that slide, but it's in your report. It's uh, table 11. Um, it's just sort of there for reference because it's way too many numbers for a slide. I apologize to everybody here. Um, Some of us enjoy it. The, uh, so the, the, the all funds budget in the county is uh, – that much greater than the than the general fund. The general fund is about one point one point one billion dollars, and the uh, there is a gap of four hundred eighty three million dollars to the to the all funds budget. So let's clear that up right there. So we are looking at the general fund initially, and we'll talk about the rest later. Um, what I'm getting at here is that these numbers are conservative. Um, the first block of five columns up there represents the computation of foregone revenue for year one, which is 2022, that year one of this four-year uh, predicted moratorium. The development that would not be built that the legislation passes would have generated approximately $14.4 million in tax revenue in 2022. 
And the second block of four columns is the weighted average impact on a unit type in 2022. So the overall weighted average revenue per dwelling was about $8,400. The rest of the columns to the right are the totals from the subsequent years of 2023 to 2025 with a total impact of about $59 million. Um, moving on to table 14, which is the next slide. Uh, this is where we talked about the one-time revenues. So outside of the property tax, real estate tax, um, and, and income tax uh, revenue, you have one-time revenues associated with construction that include transfer taxes, recordation fees, school surcharges, and road excise taxes, for example. There are some others. But I tested these four, and these are all still within the general fund. So these are added revenues from new construction. Uh, and what we have here is that it totals a, an average of about $22 million per year uh, for a total of $88 million over that four-year period. To the next table. Sorry, just real, real, real quick. Uh, on, uh, on 14, table 14, I'm just trying to reconcile the numbers on the top and the bottom. <clears throat> The 6854, is that, supposed to be, is that supposed to be a sum of all the foregone units in the... The, the, the four planning districts, yes. Five. Uh, five planning districts, yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and so um, I just ask you to go back and look at the numbers because I'm not sure your numbers add up in this particular table. Okay. Your Because uh, your, your total numbers, if I did it and I could be off as well, and the five planning areas was 8,500. So the you're the, correct. That's okay. wrong. So um, just and so just take another look to see what the net difference might might be, uh, Mr. Fox. If you, I was kind of when I was uncovering this error, I was channeling you and wondering, well, if I found this, <laughs> what did what did Greg find? So I appreciate it. After looking at a lot of numbers all day long, I you, you miss them. I can sympathize with that, but since we're talking about some serious numbers here with some serious impact, uh, it'd be yeah. important to make sure that we, we get them all right. Yeah, I will. I'll look at that here while we're doing this. I have it up. Um, we move to the other revenues. So as I mentioned earlier, there's uh, $483 million of other revenues outside of the general fund. And some of the programs that I listed there in that table uh, are, uh, are directly funded in part by new construction activity. Um, not, I, I, in other words, I can't say uh, completely that forest conservation, for example, is funded 100% by new construction activity, is funded by some other activities as well or some other sources. So I'm, I'm pointing out here that that of that $483 million, some of those programs that are funded, specially funded programs here, also gain their revenue or a portion of their revenue from new construction. Uh, it would have to be studied in a much greater detail to figure out exactly how much. But what's important is, and I'll, I'll, I've said it a few times in here and I'll say it again later, is some of these programs have to persist and be funded whether there's development or not because of state mandates or because of ongoing monitoring of programs from prior developments. So uh, this is one of those instances where, and forest conservation is a good example, forest conservation is something that takes place over years and um, that program is a state mandated program that would have to be funded somehow and monitored whether there's development starting or not. So the monies that would feed that program would have to come from somewhere else in the county budget in the future if you didn't have any inputs to it from this. That's, that's one of those things that we would need a lot more study. Um, Quick question. So you're showing uh, fire and rescue tax as a special revenue, but you're also including the revenues in the general fund. Why are you including in the general fund? It's a different revenue stream in the general fund revenue stream, the way the county budget's written up, that there's there's different elements to the fire and rescue. There's a fire and rescue uh, tax, and then there's a fire and rescue fund. It's a separately funded. Um, no, the, the, the tax, tax is the revenue the stream to go into the fund. Well, that's not the way you're 
budget read to me. That's what I'm saying. That there were when I when I was looking at line items on there, there was a separate set of funding sources for fire and rescue. Okay. I, so I think to clarify, so it is a, a bit confusing. I came across the same question. It appears that the the fire uh, tax revenues are being counted in the general fund. I think it's stated somewhere. But if you look back at the table that he comes up with the 9,300 average revenues per house, it's the fire tax revenues are not included in that. So it's just so, it's in the wrong place, yeah. but it's accounted for. Well, the, but, the, right. There's a zero net impact on yeah, the numbers. Exactly. So that's it's, it's, it's referred to in the analysis, but the bottom line is it's the bottom line fiscal analysis is of just the general fund. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so you're so not including the fire taxes. Well, no. Like I said, in this particular table here, we didn't study these revenue streams. We're saying okay. that these are revenue streams that have an impact. So some of them are highlighted because. We knew that they were directly impacted, but other ones may may or may not be. It's just the ones that jumped out. It's um, it's essentially to say that development feeds other revenue streams. It isn't saying exactly how much and by uh, which one. Okay. So the numbers aren't precise. I'm, I guess I'm trying to understand what you're saying there. I was pointing out specifically that in outside of the general fund. The construct new construction feeds other revenue streams as well. It, within the general fund, we were looking at specifically the the, the almost ninety percent of income tax and property tax and fire and rescue. And I was pointing out that there's other streams of income to the county budget that are outside of the general fund, but within the all funds of the county budget that are also funded by development. Okay, I thought you said that you counted them in the general fund. Not this, not this group. Not the four hundred eighty-three million. But the fund. Which fund? The fire tax. The, hold on a sec. The. Um, there is a fire and rescue reserve fund that is outside of the general fund. There's a program revenue fund. That, that is listed as outside of the general fund, and there's a grants fund. The grants fund, I'm not sure where that, that might be what's misidentified in the county budget as coming from outside the general fund. But, uh, but Fire and Rescue has a, uh, has allocations from outside of the general fund. I, you know, I don't think that I want to, the fire and rescue percentage is small. It's really the property tax and real estate, I mean, and income tax that are the, the key drivers here on this. And, um, and that's why I did repeat, repeat in this study that a lot more detail needs to be studied to figure out exactly where every dollar flows because at this level it really wasn't clear. We could see where the property taxes went. We could see where the income taxes went, but we could not see where it went into every particular line item of the budget. So to that point, who commissioned the study? That was us, Why? EDA. When we saw what the impact uh, could have been from a, uh, a widespread uh, you know, halt on residential construction, that uh, alarmed us, frankly. Um, our hunch was um, that may make economic development and uh, growth of existing businesses and attraction of, of new businesses more difficult if there is a, a, a limited uh, you know, housing supply. So, so we, we commissioned the study to, to ask the question. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a short question that has a long answer. We realized that we had, uh, you know, a few short weeks to pull together some um, potential impacts, and uh, you know there was a lot of uh, caveats that the uh, uh, that uh, Dr. Clinch gave us in that regard. Yeah, I'm going to uh, ask about those in a yeah. bit. So, we kind of been having this ATFO conversation for quite some time, as a county and then as a county council, and so it's just interesting that after the legislation passed you 
decided to commission the study and have a few short weeks and then the people who put the study together say, well, we really need much further study to fully understand. Uh, I'm just trying to understand that. Well, I would, I would say, I mean, APFO has been in the county for quite some time. I mean, and this particular? Not this particular, just the, the practice. What was passed yes. was part of a conversation that we've been having for a long time and was off of bills that were filed in July. Right. So the fact that there was a study commissioned uh, shortly, would you say? shortly before Thanksgiving is curious. Uh, well, I would, I would say this. The, the, the practice of APFO has been in, in place in the county for a long time, and it has been a, you know, a predictable, manageable uh, tool for, for the growth of the county. Hmm. Uh, what we saw from the most recent one with, I think, some of the amendments that were added late in the process uh, and we saw what the impact of the, what the past legislation was, uh, was, was much more alarming than a, a modification of existing APFO practices. I think, I think that the, there was a lot of conversation about going to 100. So the amendments that were actually went with the legislation were less restrictive than many other amendments that had been discussed. So it shouldn't have been surprising uh, where we landed. I think most people thought we'd land somewhere uh, in a more restrictive posture as it relates to APFO than where we were. Does that sound reasonable? Um, well, I would I would say the uh, you know what what we saw that that was that was passed. We knew there was a task force in place and the recommendations that came out of it. Um, but what was eventually passed was uh, it, it, it took the uh, the residential development just to a different a different level and was much mm -hmm. more alarming to us than. Could you talk about Dr. some of the Ball. caveat? Oh. Okay. Yeah. What I was going like to say is I would like to give Mr. Fox a chance to come and he's had his finger up and then we'll come back to you. <laughs> sure. Okay. Yeah, and I, and I guess part of it was and I, part of it, I think part is even addressing your question. I mean, I didn't know until really that night, based off of where things were going to be planned, that those maps, we just we didn't get those maps as far as the impact of those amendments until that day. So I'll tell you that I didn't know the whole thing was getting basically shut down at that point, and I think that's sort of what was alarming. Now, I still, with that said, I still have some concerns about this study that I have a lot of questions about. Um, so, I mean, so, so for, I'm sort of caught in a different, maybe I'm sort of in an in-between place here. I've got concerns about you know, what was passed, obviously I didn't, I didn't vote for it. You know, I've been one who's been very concerned about growth through my, through my tenure here more so I, I, I think I can easily say than, than my counterparts. Um, so for me, it's not about that. I think, you know, there's, there's definitely some things that needed to get addressed and I'm, I'm definitely for, you know, us, you know, supporting, you know, an after legislation that, you know, that works. But I just want to make sure that we're all, you know, working with the, the, you know, the best set of numbers and everything else. Whether that's about what actually got closed down as a result of the of, of things, which I don't think all of us knew that. If you if you guys knew it before me, somehow magically, you know, I, you didn't either. I mean, I don't, none of us had that information, so I'm not sure, you know, going into that night, um, well, you know, I, I, that, that, that could be that, I, that could be the case. The exception I, I would take on that is that it, the conversation started early on in the summer and throughout the summer and into the early fall about various scenarios. And, and we did, and I, I can't point to, and I have charts from October, early in mid-October, which Gentlemen, were, sorry. If I might. Yes, sorry, ma'am. I knew you were going to do that. That's why I try to say as much as I could before you shut down. <laughs> and I'm going to say we are here now, right? How we got here is, is the story before. We have to get to February, and so we are going to at least take in the information that is new to us, give it the weight that we believe that it deserves, as we do in everything, and move forward. So if we could move this conversation forward instead of talking about before, I think that would be Yes, ma'am, Madam Chair. My, my next question was about the caveats. What are those caveats? Uh, I'll, I'll defer to uh, Dr. Clinch to give you the, uh, the limits of, of the study. Mm -hmm. uh, on the economic impact, we need to have a better sense of what, how many units are impacted. So for the economic impact, 
uh, it's impossible in the time we had to estimate, you know, all right, ninety percent of the county is shut down. How much of the how does that translate in the units? Looking at the map and the density of the development in the areas that are white on the map, in terms of not having a restriction, um, you know, that's probably something less than ten percent of planned units. But better information there, and in terms of you know, as you you all followed with the you know, the, the Tischler Rice versus uh, Muni cap on the downtown. Uh, there was not time to do a full tischler bice average cost versus mar marginal cost fixed price model. This is a very rough fiscal model. So that one of the things when, when uh, the HCEDA approached me, because I do work in the county, to do a study, I said that type of a study, and I did a study like this in Queen Anne's County, uh, takes months uh, of time and uh, dozens of interviews and multiple scenario development, and we clearly couldn't fit that in between uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. So, so Thanksgiving. do you mean Thanksgiving and now? Uh, even Thanksgiving and now, frankly, it, it, the, the Queen Anne's County well, study. The only did one you finish these, something by Christmas and just? No, we gave some draft for the economic impact study was done, but the fiscal impact study wasn't done until days before we presented it. But the economic impact, the uh, first part. Of so the half study, of this was done in December. No, I would say I gave it draft early results to the HCDA either right before or right after Christmas, and the fiscal wasn't done until much later, and we w worked back and forth to fix issues related with the speed we had to do it. So, Mr. Fox. So I'm, I'm going to go to the, the study itself at this point. And, and I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I just want to make sure, were those all the caveats? Those are all the limitations and delimitations of the study. Yes, I think if if there's going to be something that impacts you know, ninety percent or hundred percent of development in a county, it probably need to take into account the economic and fiscal impacts more thoroughly than we were capable of so, doing in the time so yes, that was ahead. Just so want to yes. make sure. Okay, Mr. Fox. I guess my concern, you know, is, and I think somebody even said this in testimony, is that you know. The fact that we're talking about residential being net positive, and you know, and and typically, you know, at least for some residential, and residential is a net. We pretty much have heard over time that it's that it's negative, and not all, but you know, as as a whole, and definitely some categories, um, and that you know, it's our commercial base and other things that are that are helping us, um, you know, be you know, be positive at the end of the day, and I guess. I, I'm thinking part of the issue here is that you're looking at this from a static perspective. And so some of the things that are the one-time fees that are in that first period of time, you know, if you're looking at things over like that four-year period, in some ways, and that's the thing like with the downtown study, that went out, whatever, 20, 30 years. And so you'd almost be, almost stop assuming no other construction after that for the purpose of the analysis. And then what are those ongoing costs associated with serving those new residents incrementally and what are you getting in from them and what's the net present value of those dollars is really how you have to do that study. And the other part that I would have also done, you know, and I know you, I understand time limited, but that to me should have been the biggest caveat, to be honest, more than any other caveat is that, that this is, you know, the reality is this is only, you know, four years and those four years, all years you're getting both the regular, you know, tax income and you're getting all the impact fees. And that's not, the reality of, of going forward and supporting things. The second, which I think would have also been helpful, um, is in the breakout initially, because it could still all would have built. I don't think it was. What page you on? I'm looking to see what page I'm on. Um, and are you on the presentation? I'm on the presentation. Or presentation. Okay. Do we get that available to folks? It's posted now. Okay. Is, I guess, I'm not as. Con you know, Do we have if copies? If you point to a table, we can give them. Yeah, I'm just trying to find where Would it, it be possible to, to have some copies here for folks since they're here now? And well, all the all the information as well as in, if we refer to the tables, it's in it's in the report that we were given. So I mean, uh, that's been accessible. So if we so refer to the table, the people who might have it with them can look at the same numbers. We could at least there. bring up so, the numbers there, the page that you're talking about there, while you do it. Page ten. Find the number. Page 10 of the presentation. At least that's what's on, on mine. Yep. We'll see if it's the, 
Yeah, that's What's it. What's the title? Inputs and foregone Input, yep, housing. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. And it's okay. co coincidentally table 10 as well. Okay, page 23. Yeah, page, all right. That says page 23 of the report. Yeah. Um, so uh, what's good is where you have things broken out, single family, detached, townhouse, condominiums, uh, rental. I think the other thing that possibly would have been good is to have age restricted broken out separately and then have those both have that whole category, whether it's with all the the areas or not sort of irrelevant to me, but um, but having that both for revenues and cost so we could see from the category perspective, again, doing it from a net and doing it from a net present value, what are we talking? Um, because, you know, again, one of the other things that's shifted over the last handful of years um, is is actually our breakout of um, you know, single family detached and townhomes um, dropping as a percentage of overall housing too and how that along with where our commercial mix is ends up impacting us from a economic standpoint or fiscal standpoint in the county. So from, from my perspective, I think that's what needed, you know, you would need to do is to have, you know, those the categories broken out there and then um, and then also have it be more of, hey, we're talking about those four years then carrying them out after that and net present valuing those dollars back. And I think that would be actually the more helpful thing. And then I would then ask Mr. Brown, Brown now if, if the general assumptions and inputs, not right, I'm, you don't need to answer now, or say review with him those, those numbers to make sure that those inputs were good if that wasn't already done. <clears throat> so that was, okay, so that's that part of it. Uh, the only other thing I was gonna say is with, with, that, with all that said, I mean, I'm still concerned, I think, some of the things that can't get captured in the numbers are when you basically shut down a, you know, a particular industry altogether um, and versus you know, throttling it back heavily. And then where do those jobs go? Where do those businesses actually decide to locate? You know, getting, without getting into the macro stuff, the macro, the micro side of those decisions that are specific to something like this happening. So you know, now I'm arguing sort of the other side of this stuff, stuff too that I think is an important thing to be looking at on the other side of the equation. So I'm just really trying to you know look for that balance and just looking at more the realities of, of things versus a, a static, you know, macro look. One of the things you're suggesting that impacts so like we have, <clears throat> Mr. Tool, you could probably elaborate a little bit more on our commercial stock, in terms of uh, vacancy amongst our class A and B. We have a, we have a good um, healthy availability, and this question is from a economic uh, standpoint. Is it less likely that a business is coming here to occupy some of our already vacant office space because of a policy like this relative to residential? I, mean, I, I, I don't. You don't necessarily need to answer because again, I think this would. I would imagine this is part of a larger study that would get into some of the other elements uh, that um, I think you're referring to. Is, is there some other factors that we that would need to be taken into consideration to get a full, you know, checks and balances, if you will, uh, on the ledger sheet? So. I, I, any, I, anything you want to offer on that is fine at this point. Yeah, I, I have a national real estate practice. I work on you know, innovation district urban development around the country. If you have, I guess there would be two impacts, and I'm also a county resident. There would be two impacts on the county in terms of attracting companies into the county. One of the things they look at is can their employees find the housing that the employees want to have. And if that is a shortage, it enters into the discussion and would be a factor that is, goes into the decision that's made. Second, there's a dynamic change in real estate markets around the country that is favoring more urban settings, which is why we're seeing massive redevelopment in DC to the south. And there's an emerging trend in terms of redevelopment in peripheral cities like Columbia that have been able to offer that type of density, which is why the development of downtown Columbia is vitally important. And that, is, that, that model is predicated on mixed use. So you can't, if you can't attract millennials or educated people in today's environment, you're not going to attract employers. And that's going to have an impact based on the work I've done around the country on development in the county. And then I think to, to that point, since, I mean, unless I'm unaware our, of our, our, our policies as such, that is our one place of potential urban development. I know there's a lot more density that's occurring around the county. So I think a little bit more detail in terms of what is the net impact there, right, uh, f in terms of that plan, which is a 15 to 20 year plan for implementation that this four year 
period of of this slowdown of moratorium, what is then that the impact on it? Does it so that, does it extend it out another year for year, or is it three years to every one year that there's a slowdown, or do we lose all the opportunities that we in the two years of consideration deliberation we had in about downtown Columbia that that we on uh, we, we we take the, the legs out of that that plan so. and another micro difference also as having to do with Columbia is that was all predicated on certain commercial having to be developed at certain time intervals as well to balance off everything from an economic perspective versus the rest of the county doesn't necessarily have that and depending on what's been approved and where we've increased or changed density or commercial properties you know that's why knowing some of those other impacts going out further is important to us um, and the other reason is, you know, you know, there's also the discussions whether it's for, for accelerating things or whatever is understanding, you know, what, what those impacts are and making sure that our fees associated with construction are appropriate. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's really trying to balance all those things. You know, I've had a couple of conversations with folks, you know, recently on this. I mean, this is, you know, with us, with APFO and, and development, you know, sort of like the Fed and monetary policy and, you know, they can throttle through supply and they can throttle through interest rates. And for us, you know, we can throttle through, you know, basically, you know, supply of permits or whatever and, and those restrictions. And then instead of interest rate, it's also, you know, the development fees and, and everything and trying to keep all that stuff balanced. And it's not really a singular conversation. It's sort of tough because it's not, it's hard to do all at one time. But I think as we move forward into the spring, you know, with budgets and everything else, it may be, you know, whether it's coming from the county rather than EDA or whatever, it's probably something that, you know, with those caveats or with those changes in the evaluation I was suggesting might be worth taking a look at. So if you could please help us understand exactly what about the legislation is so concerning and what you're suggesting that would not adversely impact our economic forecast. I, I, I'll throw out a couple of things here just briefly. I, it wasn't part of our study to actually help uh, with that particular question, but um, uh, in my experience as a planner, um, there are there are different ways of doing your adequate public facilities besides a you know a straight moratorium, especially at a very high percentage. And so, um, one of the things that we haven't discussed, if I can just slide a little bit over to what you were talking about, Mr. Fox, is there we're looking at the based on the the program you have in place now, or the legislation that's there now, you have a four year maximum time frame but the resulting effect will not be ended in four years so we've studied a four-year period but the recovery from that four-year period may be several years more um, and we don't have that that is a great amount of, of study that would that would be difficult to work through but the the initial thing that I would say is there's annual tests instead of pushing it out a couple years on a school things like that that might might bring something in one area to a close without shutting down 90 percent of the county at one time um, that would be probably my first thing that i would be looking at is to see other ways to stratify the the school closures if you had to do that um, but the the wholesale closing of 90 percent of the school of the county at one time is what is yeah, going to be I, the most I, catastrophic I, part. I know, I know that those who have concerns about the legislation often use three terms every time they talk. Moratorium, MAP, 90%. I, I get that. But when you look at other jurisdictions in Maryland, there's a longer waiting period than four years, and places like Anne Arundel were at 100% and are now looking at 95%. Mm -hmm. So it's working elsewhere. And so maybe it's, it could be more productive and, and helpful if we focus less on terms that are, uh, have negative connotations to try to color the argument and focus more on the specifics of saying, okay, well, you're at 105, 110, 115. If you were at 110, 112, what have you, 
whatever specifics you're talking about, because right now just saying there's an economic study that you're putting a moratorium on and shutting down 90% of the development, it's going to cost millions of dollars, is very scary. But what as legislators should we be thinking about and considering to actually pass good legislation? I think that's a more productive conversation. Howard County is one of the fastest growing counties in Maryland. And I don't think Anne Arundel County is facing the same growth patterns that we're having here. So the, it might be easier for them to have an APFO given the slower pace of development. And the question is, we do have a fiscal imbalance. And the how do we pay for that you know, becomes a question. So if you have a moratorium on growth, and it does cost money, how do you then build out of it in terms of build the school and roads and other facilities that are needed? So wait a minute. You're Wait. saying that there's all this infrastructure that's needed and the way to get the infrastructure is to build out of it. Is that you, if you don't build and you uh -huh. lose jobs and money, how do you build out of it without looking at it? The question is the appropriate balance, and I don't know how to achieve that. But zero, so there's got to be somewhere between zero and full bore growth that, that's feasible. Hmm. So the question is the appropriate balance. How long does it take to get a school on board and those types of things? Well, we have some friends from the Board of Education here. Um, I don't know if you all were able, we, I think we even invited you. If you had an opportunity, have you looked at the study? Or are you able to? Is it all right, Madam Chair? I don't yeah, I don't, I don't know. So, Dr. Paul's questions, but um, well, let's, I, I, so I think So let's do it this way, till. right, and I know that not only Dr. Ball, did you want to speak with them, but uh, Mr. Fox had indicated that he was interested in speaking with our Board of Ed. Any other questions uh, for these gentlemen? Well, just uh, about about the study, I mean, to give me a second, I have a, had a bunch of questions that I wanted to make sure we weren't answered in the conversation. So, I mean, I think many of them, many okay. of them have. But in the interim, though, uh, we have the advantage of Mr. Brown. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, sir, but... Um, so let's just, just, let's finish with with yeah, that, and then we will give ask. my colleague a, a moment to, yeah. to conclude Mr. this Fox. conversation. Thank you. My mic on. <laughs> uh, it was in my ears. That isn't necessarily. Uh, that's right. So, um, but now we have these new mics, and I can pick up your conversation on my mic now too. So, uh, in. in You've heard some of the questions that we've asked and some of the concerns and other caveats that were presented, and I, and I, and I appreciate it. And let me, let me just be clear about my, my interest is that I do agree that there's much more to study here, and, you know, I, I know you've expended some funds to, to, to have the study done at this point. I, I, I would love for this to continue and go to the level of detail that you, you conducted in Queen Anne's or where, wherever else is appropriate to get a full accounting of the impact so that, to Dr. Ball's point, we have we have a true uh, sense of the number. Because at the end of the day, if the answer is we are, the, the amount that we're in the hole is this much and we can fill it by raising the fees, which we are working with our delegation to do, then we can potentially mitigate, maybe not all, but some of that impact with the fees uh, that way. Um, you know, as, as much as I'm rude to suggest, there are other fees and taxes and such that could account if the community is demanding that we pull back on development then I don't know if there'd be a surprise that there'd be some additional impact on the cost of, 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 of living here and so there are other elements that but we can't even get to that until we know what is the essence of our impact and 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 in full disclosure you and I served on the spending affordability advisory committee together for a couple of years many years ago, and uh, I always look forward to your presentations and your, your input. So I know you come from a very <coughs> credible uh, 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 scholarly position that is, is worthy of our attention. So I, I would love to see more, is, is, is my point. Having said that, then my question uh, to you, Mr. Brown, is, is in, in your consideration and all the conversations that we've had leading up to our uh, decisions in November, uh, is, is there, are there any other uh, pieces of data here that you think could, could be improved or that are, are, are problematic that we want to make sure we, we get right uh, in that consideration? In the fiscal study itself? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I concur. It is a very high-level study, so I think there's a lot of room for improvement on it. 
Um, a lot, of, some things were mentioned. Um, there's other points that could be mentioned that I, when I took a look at it. So I think I think your point is well said that that I think given the time constraints that they had, uh, it is a general overview and a high level study, and it does start um, bringing up questions that could answer. I think the economic impact study is is um, probably pretty pretty good in terms of what the economic impacts are. The fiscal study, uh, the costs and the revenues, I think need to be looked at in a little bit more detail to figure out the uh, I, I, I would agree with that characterization. Right. I mean, I, I think the numbers at, at that level, particularly how they apply and the proportionality in which they're applied in terms of what, what specific costs there are, or the fees, and, and again, you can do scenarios and, and testing. Like, so if, for example, if uh, the proposal before the delegation is to double and triple fees, if that were to be worked in, what would truly the fiscal impact be. And, and as we know, the legislation that's proposed relative to the AFO test goes into effect a year from now, year and a half. Um, not that I want to kick the can down the road relatives, but if it does require more time, then more time can be taken so that if, in fact, some additional changes need to take place, not only do we have this, uh, this session in Annapolis to make those adjustments, but, um, but then we have another session in 19 to make additional adjustments if we need them. Uh, I know I've asked and would love our delegation to give us full authority to change the fees however we'd like. I don't think that's going to happen, um, but, um, but they, I'm sure, would be looking for some of the same information we're asking for today to make, to make their determinations on how, how to make those, uh, make those adjustments. Um, so, I mean, I, th there might be some other follow-up things, and, and, and uh, I know we can access these we folks can certainly uh, ask. Uh, mm -hmm. separately. Uh, we have other guests that are bringing different perspectives on it. So, but I, but I, I, I truly appreciate uh, bringing up this information so that we have a basis for a conversation, which I, which I hope that will continue. continue. And, and just, just to be clear, um, I mean, you know, we, we looked at this from, a, from an economic development perspective, and uh, we also recognize that... Um, we're not an attractive uh, place to do business if our schools are overcrowded and you know service declines. This, you know we believe that the education system is a a very large part of the economic development and attractiveness to to businesses. So, um, you know we're not we're not saying it's an all or nothing thing. I think the specific recommendations are, um, you know, I don't have a specific recommendation for you except to say that uh, a process that is predictable and offers a, a, you know, a, a variety of housing availability across the, the, the spectrum of affordability is important for a predictable uh, process that makes it attractive, that balances all of the needs. So um, we wanted to, uh, we didn't mean to throw a fly in the, uh, in the soup, but uh, what we did want to do is understand that there are, um, you know, maybe it, it's worthy of deeper study. Yep. So we appreciate your time. And, Thank Mr. You. Twill, thank you. thank you, Mr. Clinch, Dr. Clinch, Mr. Steer, thank you very much. Do you much. need us to stay or? Um, Madam Chair, if, there, if it's okay, if they could kind of hang out in case there are other questions until you completely change it. Until we get house. done with our, with our fiscal things. Yes, if you wouldn't mind staying, that would be um, potentially helpful. Thank you. Because right? and, and, we could have, we, we may have revolving chairs. <laughs> and, and Mr. Okay. Twill, at least with you as, as well, even if we're done with the finance stuff, it may just be helpful to hear the rest of the discussion anyway, so it may be worth you staying around Got it. rather than keeping consultants around. <laughs> so we're still working, well, we're still working on this broad umbrella of fiscal. We began with the study that was presented to us. <laughs> Dr. Ball, I think you indicated that you might have some questions for members from the Board of Education, and I know Mr. Fox had indicated that, so mm -hmm. let's go there next. Yes, ma'am, Madam Chair. So I think we have um, Ms. Delmont Small, Ms. Coombs, Mr. Blum. Looks I know like we have this. Ms. Kamen and Mr. Gist are sitting over there against the wall. Yeah, trying to avoid eye to contact. To them, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't know where your questions are headed, so would so it be to start, wise to invite them up as well? Sure, but I wanted to start broadly if okay. you all had an opportunity to read the study and had any initial thoughts or reaction. Uh, we did just get it, but we have been paying 
rapt attention to uh, to this. Um, we had some of the same concerns that Mr. Fox raised as to the um, the impacts, um, the costs of service as well, because um, that does not seem to have been presented. And I had questions about the net present value um, and how that was how that was being done. Um, we had some concerns about the um, about the yields that are used as far as pupil. Um, the ones, although they are correct, they are only correct for county-wide averages. Our feasibility process um, goes to a much more granular level. Um, and so the numbers that are on page 30 of the report that are pupil yield, um, they are new construction for county-wide for an average of five years. So to apply that number to the um, to each of the, the areas seems, um, seems somewhat problematic and could overstate the number of students. Um, the, other, the other things that surprise us, I guess, considering that we have a, um, um, a large amount of, we have currently a, about a reported number of 22% free and reduced meals, and a lot of that is uh, centered in our Columbia area. And so we were sort of surprised to see some of these numbers on the, the housing prices um, that are in Columbia versus Ellicott City. Uh, those, those seem rather overstated. Um, that, um, so we were, we were concerned about some of those. Um, you know, Columbia having an average uh, single-family house of being almost a million dollars for sale. I'm not sure where exactly that's coming from, but um, yeah, maybe Dr. Ball, you also live in Columbia. Is your, is your house a million dollars? That I know of. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My townhouse is not five hundred and fifty-five thousand dollars either, and um, so some of some of these numbers uh, don't really make sense to us. Um, but we do have a concern on the yields, and then obviously there would also be the impact of um, when there are new students. Um, those those are costs as well. So um, those would then, then be savings because the school system would not be servicing those students either. So um, you've got to include both the revenue and the cost side. No, I would just like to say that as yourselves, we would like to we would appreciate some more time to live with this document and provide um, a better response, I think, so that we can have a continued discussion over this. Because I agree with my colleague. There's some of the assumptions made in here, and the data does not seem to track with what um, we know is reality here in Howard County. And I think having a look at that would be helpful. Um, and the fact that it is a very high level, and um, Ms. Coombs touched on this, especially dealing with schools as far as capacity and what our different parts of the county look like, it's very different. You have a very different experience out in the rural west versus in Columbia. And for us, we need to take all of that into consideration. So that may provide additional perspective to this document that I think would be helpful from our perspective and your perspective when we discuss schools. And that's what it's Are, are we going to have an opportunity with other topics to talk to them, or is this? So yes, I'm just okay, wondering if I should yeah, ask my questions up, um, now, or you only get two wait. chances. I'm just I'm just deferring to the chair here. I don't want to jump out of order on her. I don't want to get my fingers knocked, my knuckles whacked. Are you? Where are you going? Where, where are you going? Oh, to, just to ask the question. To their testimony. Ah, to their testimony. To their testimony. Okay. Um, uh, could could we ask Ms. Kamen uh, to, she has not really had a chance to look at it, but if she had any comment that she wanted to make regarding. I have not had a chance to look at the study. Um, I would say um, that um, be careful with our yields because they change. They're not standing. They shift yearly because we, again, do cohort survival and everything. So the numbers here are countywide average for 2017. Mm -hmm. um, they go up and down just a little bit, but they, they're not standing. Mr. Yep. Bronow wants to weigh in, Madam Chair. I've got it. One of the points that, um, that I noticed that the yields are in the study, but the yields are not used to calculate revenues. So that's one of the, one of the problems with or the costs. study. Or costs. Or costs. I'm, I'm sorry, costs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, they're, and there's a sentence that says they're just here for informational purposes. Right. So I just don't want to confuse that point. No, they, 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 they should be yeah. included in terms of um, 
in terms of the cost to the general fund. Right. And I think I think it's reasonable for us to um, say that we actually I think agreed with the folks who did the study that, that was indeed the case, that they admitted that the study was very very high level, and we've already identified. Um, I, I think a, the costs, in, in fact, are overstated because they're using the same yields for all housing units types equally. So they're using the same student yields in apartment units as oh, townhouses. Right, right. They just use the, the, they use they the use, they basically school use level it. applied to all They, they basically, units. the way they did right. it, they took the, the education budget and divided it by the number of housing units in the county to get an average education cost per house and then applied that average cost yeah. to the future units. Right. Even and though most of the future units are apartments and condos. Yeah, and, and so I think from it, you bring up a very really good point right. in terms of fidelity, and now we're taking, I know we're yeah. taking a step back, I apologize, but it's I think an important no. point in terms of fidelity. Um, that difference in cost versus revenue, mm -hmm. I believe, and even some of the caveats suggested that could address some of the gap. Again, I don't know if it's all the gap, some of the gap, but, but there are situations that that the costs, in fact, are equivalent to. It could be, and, and their study actually says that the costs right. are um, are greater than the revenues. Yes. Mr. Fox had the, had the pointed out the long term, not counting the one time fees. Right, mm -hmm. they're showing that this is going to create uh, thirteen hundred deficits. Yeah. So right. it's actually good to have a all growth stop. Right. Yeah. Which is what I. Which is so, where but I, I, I I'm not convinced into, there's there's with, there's major yeah. issues with their overestimation of costs. Yeah. And, and, right. and, and then we get into the, the, the perspective, right, of, of, of what is the trigger for halting, slowing, stopping, whatever, for what's the, the best condition. And, 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 again, we get into the, the ripple effect and how many years that that does actually happen. So you had specific questions. Well, uh, yeah, but just now that you've gone, gone there. But, I mean, that's, you know, mm -hmm. generally, you know, what I said. But part of it is in your plan, you're, you've got both your residential and your commercial and your industrial growth, and it's all – you know, it's all part of that piece. And so the question is, you know, how far out of balance? That's why back during at one point, you know, when you had made a statement like we didn't have any issues, and I was like, well, it's because we balanced either by deferring things or whatever. We do need to look at those look at those costs and, and everything. But even if it does show up negative because it's part of that whole balance because it impacts other things with commercial, that doesn't mean it gets shut down 100 percent either. So and that's and I think that's sort of, you know, what I think where we need to address and going to one of Dr. Ball's earlier things is trying to find where does that, that thing. And I do have some ideas that, that I thought of and ran by Mr. Cook while I was being bad, according to Ms. Sigety, um, <laughs> um, that I think could be could be helpful. Um, can I so go, go ahead, ahead and ask? Yep. A, mm -hmm. So one of the things in your guys' testimony, you know, the other day, and this, this has to get into this whole, you know, 100% thing. And, you know, look, I, I you know, I, my kids went through here, and as I've said many times publicly, I, you know, come from a family of teachers, and you know, my mother, my mother-in-law, uh, my wife, my daughter will be one at the end of this year when she graduates, um, and you know, so I understand you know concerns about being, you know, over, you know, too too much, you know, having overcapacity and everything else. I also understand that there's reasons to, in certain years, not just to redistrict for your districting sake, to to go be going back and forth to keep things right. At 100%, I understand that part too, and I think there was a lot of good points made about the cost of portables and the fact that those just become wasted dollars that never really get invested in the schools and just become a maintenance thing. So trying to manage down the amount of portables also ends up becoming a very important thing because once those dollars are gone, they're they're gone. They're, I mean, they're not helping us in in any way. <laughs> just just saying, and so when you when you're looking at some of this stuff and you guys are telling, you know, talking about development stopping 100 percent, then, you know, part of what I would have to ask, too, is I look at even after this latest redistricting and there was opportunities to bring schools with neighboring schools next to them down to under 100 percent. If it was that important, why weren't they brought down to under 100 percent? I'm just trying to understand, you know, the logic in the testimony compared to your actions as, as redistricting, as well as the lack of redistricting over the last however many years. Well, to the redistricting, we wanted to um, wait f until we fa found High School 13 um, because we want to know where that is because that's going to have a trigger effect, right? So uh, that was one reason why we wanted to not have a series of redistrictings that would affect the same group of children over the next few years. Um, so we wanted to reduce the impact 
uh, on that. And the, the primary function of the system is educational outcomes. So um, the disruption to children and parents is a negative one in general. Uh, so the, the primary focus is what is the outcome and are we really moving the needle anywhere when we're going to have to go back and probably do something much larger and greater um, rather than doing something cosmetic at this point. And, and, and I, I concur with that, actually. Um, but then I guess part of the question, too, is, is not just this redistricting, but, you know, even well before this, this is something that you can look back. We, we've pretty, got 13 months. I know. I, I understand <laughs> that. I understand you have 13 months, and Mr. Weinstein only has three years, and a lot of this stuff has been building for well longer than 10. Um, you know, some of the stuff around Turf Valley has been building for 30 um, or whatever. But, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I understand that, but I still think it's an important question for us to ask um, whether, you know, as a body, not necessarily you as individuals, but as a body, you know, why that wasn't happening. Because I think that's part of what actually caused the level of chaos is go around and the timing of everything, which put a lot of negative discourse into the mm -hmm. community, was the fact that this stuff had not been addressed previously and it built up and built up and you know I remember and you know this is even before Miss you know Count, uh, Chairman Sigity was on the, the school we're going back to when I first moved here I remember redistricting happening pretty continually mm -hmm. and you know when people then you know were talking about how many times did their kids get redistricted it from in elementary school just just one kid not multiple kids and it could be they could have been in three elementary schools right this is French redistricted her right. a few times yeah right. and, and and things were that crazy back then so it, it's sort of funny when I hear all the all the, the redistricting stuff I guess now because compared to 20 years ago it's right. not even close well that's also <laughs> because we've slowed down the rate of opening new schools so it's right. not as it's not as right because some of the prevalent. Slowed down, it has slowed down slowed. there were so right, many that were down. opened over a period of time where it's not as necessary and clearly this time opening up Hanover, Hanover Hills was the the trigger on this one but but, but I guess a lot of people's feelings is, you know, growth has sped up or things have increased because of the perception of this massive redistricting and, you know, or the, but that potential redistricting, that was a lot of what we were hearing in testimony. I'm not sure I understand it. We, growth, we were hearing, growth has sped up redistricting. I think, back, back, I, think, back then. I think several people were concerned that when the first uh, discussions about redistricting, about 8,000 kids came out, it was because right. there's been this explosion of growth over the last gotcha. no, few probably. years. Yes. Yes. Sorry, as, a, as opposed to um, much less redistricting over the last Correct. 10, 15 Thank years. Thank you, Dr. Ball. Right. Um, because we've begun we are the see. fastest growing county. I mean, that's what <laughs> yeah, we, we are. are. I mean, we are, but the percentage is right. But that percentage, we're one of the only ones actually growing in students too. At, right. You know, at this point, but that growth today is still considerably less than what that growth percentage was going back in the '90s. I mean, it's substantially less. Right. But like Ms. Coombs was saying, they were building schools at that time in to deal with that. Right. Right. So. It was right, more, and, and I think people see, and this might not sound great, but people see moving into a new school that ha has just been built as not really the same thing as being redistricted. I think that can be a perception thing as well. Uh, that's true. That's a, that, no, that's a, that, and that is that is definitely a true statement. But you know, one of the things, as you know, is you know, you use River Hill for example is a it's great great thing that ended up being way higher than anybody thought it was going to be in its numbers initially you know, took things out, and then as those kids all aged out, then that area, I mean, things are going to change, you're going to shift, and, you know, we're, we're in a county that is a county school system, we are not a township, so for anybody who came from New Jersey or Pennsylvania or Illinois or something like that, I'm sorry, but we are a county school system, mm -hmm. and we have county resources, and it's our job to utilize those effectively and manage those effectively, and, you know, there is no guarantees or not, we don't, I mean, if you're a walker, I, th I think there should be, hopefully you guys are trying to do your best to, to make sure people that are walkers aren't moving. But outside of being a walker, we're, we are a countywide school system and it's countywide resources and everybody's paying those, you know, same taxes, same taxes teachers, right. principals, everything gets rotated around. And I think some sometimes that's uh, forgotten as well. But I think part of it is, is, is that people haven't seen the redistricting in so long. And I understand why you wouldn't have gotten to there this year. And I know you both are new. But but we did, I mean, we did make, we did take steps, for instance, Manor Woods was egregious. And we did take steps to um, ameliorate that situation. For instance, right. um, you know, some of the polygons that don't have any houses in them yet, we have moved them farther west so that we can utilize those resources. 
Um, and so we did make uh, some steps to move um, some places where we felt like it was a, a nightmare for people. Um, but there are other areas, like you said, with walkers, like Stevens Forest, you can't really do anything. Stevens Forest and Talbot Springs, you can't really do a lot about that because that's mainly a, a walker area. So, and, unfortunately, and, and that's why we're adding right, may, space to Talbot Springs. Can I just kind of finish on this, this part of the thought? I, I just, Please finish, just, Mr. Fox. Yeah. So, so going back to the, the 100%, I totally understand where you're coming from on all those answers. I know you guys aren't responsible for what happened prior. But when now you're using logic for not being at 100% and moving people unnecessarily, whether it's this time or even after the school's built, there's going to be those reasons. Should that number being right at 100% then be the number on a per school basis, or should that be on, again, not regions because the regions don't really touch each other, but like an adjacency test as it relates to that 100% versus it being on a school? Like to view flexibility, it's also not penalizing or forcing people or questioning people's judgment as far as in why they did decide to redistrict or not redistrict in any particular year. You understand what I'm saying? I understand what you're saying. I'm not sure what the question is. is are you talking about how we are not necessarily in, we, that we want to remove the language regarding the um, regional? Well, regional, and then you're talking about a school capacity at 100 percent. And I guess, you know, Mr. I, I, go ahead. Mr. Fox. Yes, go ahead. Are you trying to ask um, in relation to redistricting? And in relation to APFO, so we have um, in the bill that we have in front of us, we have, you know, limits on the schools, right? And those limits uh, are um, school and then region and for elementary schools and then for middle and high school. Are you, I think Mr. Fox is trying to ask about the reality of if you don't want to redistrict um, all the time, right? You want to give some flexibility there so that you don't have to move people all the time. Shouldn't there be some consideration when you have schools that are adjacent to each other where those two could make up 100% each as opposed to, and, and not have it be a, a penalizing effect in relation to APFO? Because you would have the capacity, you've just chosen not to use it. Is that where you were that's exactly, okay. that's exactly right because effectively you know a school board could just let things sit forever and effectively shut things down and you know inadvertently without any control by the council or or anybody else because you guys if we put those types of numbers in and we don't control the redistricting you do that you know if you if something like what just happened in the past however many years happens again where you're just letting it go stagnant for however long you're going to end up with schools at 70% or so, which is, which, is, which is what's happened. And you're going to end up with schools heading, you know, even, even without areas with growth in them, you know, just due to, uh, you, know, re, re, you know, people buying existing homes, numbers just kept going up in certain areas as well. They were going to 110, 115. So, but those were decisions you guys were making. They weren't decisions we were making. Right, but the open close chart is also a projection as well. And so there, and there are going to be the, the peaks and valleys of, of where, right. I, I understood, and that's why having an adjacency, not region, because the regions, you got schools that don't match at all in the, in the regions that we have, and even if you had regions that, that even better matched, you still end up with ones that are on the edge of a region. It doesn't make sense for them to be the ones you would be looking at. So if you had schools on opposite sides of a region, that both, you know, one was high and one was low, it's not, it, mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that was going to So, and maybe, sense. maybe Mr. Gister, Ms. Kamen can answer this more specifically, but um, are you talking about s sort of like when, uh, as far as the public school construction for the state, when they look at what can be funded, they're looking at the adjacent schools. Basically, so from a yeah, funding, so, yes. so if the language, yes. so if the language um, mirrored that, Close, more specifically, yeah, or something, close, something around that. I can't. I don't have. I don't remember the exact language, so I'd have to go look or, or whatever. But something along those lines mm -hmm. that would be sort of that balance, because I think that I think might help address all sides to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Because you're not going to be forcing people into redistricting. In some cases, when you're like at 103 and 97, does it really make sense to disrupt the community at that point? And especially right. if it may be dipping down, or the other school is going to go up to 100, so they wouldn't have that room anyway in, you know, in a couple of years. Right, it's not you worth have, it. Right. You're, 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 it allows, it allows you to plan you know, you know, accordingly. 
um, and but it doesn't necessarily penalize based off of the capacity that we actually have there. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, you know, I, I, I mean, because I have, I definitely have concerns when I'm seeing some of these high numbers. I have no problem, you know, with things shutting down, regardless if it's from development or from you know people coming back in or whatever. And I, you know, that doesn't bother me at all. But it, it concerns me when I'm seeing, a, you know, 110 here and 90 here and. You're, we're going to say <laughs> the 110 can't go, and we're sitting there with 90 adjacent to it. That's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, the, the, the chart, I think, Ms. Camus, I think you provided us the these yeah. uh, latest. And so it shows three regions that are for at least a couple of years uh, or several years, now actually two that go out until 25 or so, where they're under the 105%. A couple of them are under 100%. And so if, if that's what you're talking about, right, to align it. Yeah. Exactly. Ms. Coombs, you, you were talking about the language relative to funding. So it seems like the reasons are potentially a, a, it's a, a natural organization of the of the schools as we have now. It could be. Yeah. So, all right. I was just going to ask, can somebody get us that language, the state language? I just, sometimes when it's everybody's job, it's nobody's job, and we walk yeah. away and we don't know who is it, supposed to be. Yes. <laughs> and I think we, and I think we may have question, it. Yeah. Yes. I, I'm sorry. I, I've been having three conversations and about ten in my head right now. Um, How are they going? When you're, <laughs> I'm arguing with myself That's right true. now. Um, Do you have different names? <laughs> <laughs> um, my poor children. Um, <laughs> when you're talking about adjacency and doing the test, are you also saying that I'm developer A, I'm in school district B, but school district C has room. Can I, as the developer, now go to C? Because some adequate public facilities ordinances around the state, um, a developer can ask that question to be redistricted. But and sometimes we, and that we doesn't specifically that, have that on our table right no, now. Yeah, okay. No, no, so you're talking no. just no. moving forward because A and B or C and B have, okay. Yes. Well, well I, I think, I don't think. There's unanimity no, no, about no, no. what we're talking about. What I'm hearing is that we want to understand the definitions and how regions relates to adjacency and how funding at the state level relates to what we passed. At least that's I want to just understand more. That I'm seems not, relatively reasonable. I'm not promoting what you're talking about at all. I just, no, neither. That's what I'm saying. I, I was having so, three conversations so, literally as this conversation so, was going so, on. So, that's so, fine. Yeah, so to be clear, I wasn't promoting what so, you said that's fine. at all. Um, that's and, but, absolutely but, fine. But, um, <laughs> yeah, yes, I'd like to have that information, but yet, either way, you know, in my head. So you're talking state, how we define at the state have, level. I think we have some of that from the last go around yeah. that we might be able to find and, and, and everything, but that was a general concept that may, may not be exact. So in, it's the in, state rate of capacity seven years out. And the project, our projected enrollment, because we have to get approval to use but the, our local projection. The adjacency language is what the we're talking. The adjacency language. That's what we're talking about, because it has to do with the adjacency. Didn't we already look at that? Other, the, no, we have some other jurisdictions. Yeah. Okay, but, we've certainly had something. this conversation, conversation with with Ms. Kamen, and when we asked yes. you to explain about, mm -hmm. yeah, we had the first. Part. Um, there are a couple of different conversations. Right. That's why I'm trying to. There's the state rated for funding yeah. purposes, uh, which is state rated capacities seven years out with our using our projection that's one and then there is the adjacency that myself um, and um, Jeff and Carl went through to see if adj the adjacency test would work and um, you also I think talked with us about how um, in figuring out the um, for state rated capacities or for whether or not there'd be state funding, how you looked at adjacent schools yes. and, and how much, how many students you projected would be coming out of each of those schools to determine whether or not there yes. were enough students to actually fill the school that you were proposing to build. Yes, correct? and that's that how much that's how we can get approval for state funding is showing the need of the state rated capacity. And and I believe you you also talked about, you gave us a, basically the form, we a map, the in, well yeah. it was a map yeah. in my head, you, you did one of these, right, and you mm -hmm. talked about the number of schools around your Yeah, so your if, if, overcrowded it's a, if, it's a new, if it's a new school that we're projecting, uh, we're doing like, for example, High School 13, we, wherever it's placed, we would look at the adjacent attendance areas right. for that school to see if there first is a need for mm -hmm. that new school, and then second, um, how that's used to anticipate funding for the state. And when you say adjacent, in that, it, using that term, 
if I'm if I'm in. looking at a new school, um, so just for fun's sake, mm -hmm. because I don't, I, but just because, fun or fund, just for fun, <laughs> fun at this point, or just just for imagining, right? If we if we take Mission Road, mm -hmm. all right, what's a what would be considered adjacent? Would that be every 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 we would use every attendance area that could be impacted by that site. So it would okay. be reservoir. Contiguous. It would be reservoir, Hammond, um, Oakland, Oakland Mills. Mills, Longreach, and Howard. Okay, because they could potentially fit into a redistricting scenario. Okay, and that's and what that's the what state asks you to do. So, but it's not everything impacted. It's not the domino effect. It's the ones that would be direct, the first direct. step. The first, right. I just want to make sure. Okay. Right. Because I yeah. would and not that's want to be going out past that. They have that. to touch, touch each other. other. There that's, are certain, that's they have to touch each other. So that's physical the other connection. Got it. I guess just Mr. to clarify. Mr. Weinstein. Uh, yeah, I was going to make one statement. That it's uh, that we have a couple of folks from the task force actually sitting right behind you. One was the co-chair. One was one of the members. So in terms of adjacency, if. Yeah, because I believe that was already. Yeah, I would. I mean, partially. We never really, partially. We, we, in the context of this well, particular conversation, uh, right? Just and so the question is because I'd wanted to talk about things that were new. We have talked about adjacency, but they did bring it up, one hundred percent up, 100%. and right. redistricting has happened since we made our other decisions. So it may be at least worth giving a little bit. Uh, a it, little bit of consideration. Yeah. Yeah. And, right, so. and that's why I wanted to just be able to ask the questions to them, which they answered, and, and, and I'm mm -hmm. trying to just get that perspective, you know, and I I, I didn't hear, a, a, like, a large pushback. I didn't hear agreement, but I didn't hear it. It's, but it's something we, we worth, did hear a lot from the community. On, I mean, we heard a lot on this issue, on the adjacency issue. Yeah. I, I remember extensive discussions of I, it, and I believe there was the same in the task force. I guess I'm trying to understand where we're going with all this. We voted on a bill in November, and I don't understand why we're having all these questions. It's, it's making everybody go back through the whole same thing. How much information do we have? What was that information? We voted on a bill in November. I don't know why the vote's not the same. It's your prerogative. I mean, we also... Do we have any other questions, we've also, we've also with Mr. This. Fox? Yes. Do we have any other questions for the Board of Ed? I do not. Not yet. I mean, are they going to stay around for I thought we were going to talk about other topics we may well they're here do you, would you like to start another topic as long as it's not affordable housing I think everything else fits in under this one well and I do think they have something to say about affordable housing well, we can, as well. when we get there right but do you have any other things that you'd like to ask them um, outside of the affordable housing discussion not at this point okay anybody do else? they have anything else to Thank you. And please don't leave. <laughs>EDA study, we've talked about fiscal analysis, we've talked with the Board of Ed about fiscal issues. Are there other fiscal issues, other folks that you would like to hear from? Don't mind you who we invited. So any more conversation on fiscal issues? Well, then it looks like at quarter to seven, we could stand up and stretch for a minute and a half and then, and then begin an affordable housing conversation. Can we do that? Stretching, Stretching would be good. Actually, give us five. Guests, council guests, if you have a conversation that you want to engage in, please take it out into the lobby. We're going to try to get back to work. This would be the point at which we would...
if there's any new folks in the room, I would say um, if you have a device that makes noise, please turn it off. Okay, because we don't want to be pointing our fingers at you. All right, so we finished fiscal, and the other, as I said, the other part that was in my head was talking about um, affordable housing. And um, so if we could do that, that would be a good thing. So, Mr. Engel, can I ask you to come up, please? Yes. I apologize. I'm looking for something. So, um, Mr. Engel, you, um, uh, Carol McPhee delivered your testimony, and she talked about multiple things in relation to APFO and the Housing Commission. Mm -hmm. And then we heard, um, so then there was some discussion or some um, comments that were made about Howard County and opportunity areas and how I, um, we heard testimony that from, I think it was, uh, I think it was Grace Morris back in the, in the back talking about how Howard County was going to be opening up areas of opportunity. And then we heard some testimony about uh, areas that were closing as areas of opportunity. So if you wouldn't mind helping us see the landscape of Howard County and areas of opportunity, and what does that mean for us? Um, I think what this is largely referring to is the state um, qualified allocation plan, which is how they um, distribute tax credits, the low-income housing tax credit for affordable housing. Um, the state, while it's not finalized yet, is working on a draft of the um, distribution process that gives a lot of points in the system for um, what are called communities of opportunity and communities of opportunity are communities that generally have uh, higher incomes, less foreclosure, better schools, better transportation. Um, Access to employment. Add in as well. Access to employment is also a part of it. Right. So Inflation. Howard County is, is such an area. Their current map um, has the entire county as a community of opportunity. Um, there was a reference at the testimony also to the Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership, which is a nonprofit, and in the interest of full disclosure, I was on their board for a number of years, um, but am no longer, uh, that was charged coming out of a fair housing suit with um, helping um, former public housing residents in Baltimore to move to areas of opportunity or communities of opportunity. They have their own definition, which is slightly different. Um, the vast majority, and I have maps of these if people are interested, the vast majority of the county is open under that definition as well um, for, for uh, finding homes for people who are looking to be in good school districts and mm -hmm. uh, with good employment opportunities and uh, the other benefits that would come from living in Howard County. Do those opportunity areas afford any advantages as um, we look to how we can provide affordable housing either through low-income housing tax credits or other state and federal programs? So in particular with the tax credit, the, the low-income housing tax credit is, is the resource that drives pretty much all, not quite all, but the vast majority of affordable housing development. Um, and this, the state plan allocates that. Um, there are two types of credit, but the valuable one is limited and is highly competitive. Um, one out of every three to four projects <laughs> typically win. There is now, um, because the state went through, was um, had discussions with uh, HUD and um, ACLU and others about potential fair housing problems. Um, they went through a conciliation process, and this new plan is a response to that, where they are looking to put 1,500 units in areas of opportunity around the state, not obviously all here. Um, and so there is a significant number of points in the scoring system that go for communities of opportunity. Um, that is expected to come out with their new plan sometime this spring. Um, and if APFO passes and we don't have 
area available for that development means that just as they're saying we could have these state resources and federal resources to help produce affordable housing in Howard County, we're going to be saying we don't have the land to do it. That's, that's our concern from the affordable housing front. Okay. So we don't have the land or we don't have or We don't have the capacity. Or we're shutting down the ability to, to produce that affordable housing because of the schools test primarily. Okay. And so correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so that means that it's related, if I heard correctly the other night as well, it's related to a time frame of if we can go after, if, if, if someone who were developing a for, uh, low income housing tax credit or, or other um, state and federally funded programs were going after something like this, that there's a time frame related to it. Is, and that's one of the areas where we get into a little bit of difficulty. Right. There are a couple things with affordable housing projects. One typically is that um, you don't have the upfront capital to hold land for four years and, and just keep waiting. Affordable housing deals usually get their money for the acquisition with the whole closing, and, and um, they just don't work that way financially. Two is that the tax credit has to be used within two years of winning the allocation. Um, and that, that two years, you need to have one of those years is building. So you have to really, you usually have a year to finish your planning and close and a year to build. Um, and if you don't meet that deadline, you lose the credits. Okay. And that actually is a real problem for the state. They do not want to allocate credits to projects that don't move. That very rarely happens. And if you are a developer and that happens to you, you lose points going forward. There are all sorts of penalties. It's a situation nobody wants to be in. For sure. I've got Dr. Ball had his hand up. Mr. Fox is looking at me, so. Um, I, I went ahead. I'm trying to get used to using the uh, John Weinstein uh, system, so. Remember, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you had your little light buttons uh, that you tried up there. Um, so, uh, now, were you there the other night or not? I was. You were there. So, one of the questions that I, I had sort of posed out there is, you know, if we're shut down, you know, pretty much in every other way and all we're doing is adding affordable housing, you know, how, how do you, you know, from a county perspective, how do you think we should be looking at that at that point? I mean, from a fiscal standpoint, you know, how does that then benefit the county if that's our only residential growth at that point? Well, I think, I think it benefits the county in a number of ways. Yeah. One is that the county residents who are currently struggling could more easily afford their, you know, where they're living. So that benefits those people directly. Um, you mean where they're currently living? If they're right. Living. Yeah, I don't understand. Don't, like yeah. current well, there, we have homeless population. We have much of the count, much many of the renters in the county are burdened by their rents today. So they're we, paying 50% of income for rent or something along those lines. So if you provide affordable housing, those people have housing that's cheaper. So not in their existing housing. You're talking about if they buy new. If, if they, you were to develop affordable housing, you would be. And they free. were to move. Right. <clears throat> so you're saying. Okay. They may already be in the county. Either. They are already in the county. Yes. Yes. Is, 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 do you have a percentage of folks that are Could, yeah. occupying or that move into yeah, the projects you build that uh, are already in the you know, So what percentage of them are already in the county? And yeah, because previously when we've gotten that data in the past, it hasn't been a, a high percentage of those that were already in the county um, that ended up moving into those units. Right. Well, um, no, I don't, I don't have, you know, data on exactly, you know, for each project where folks have come from. I do know that the old Dorsey Center serves pretty much only folks who are already living here. Not exclusively. There's still people who would come in, but that's 35 units for homeless residents. Who, that's different than, um, that's, I, I think that's a little bit different than the units your, your guys are talking about. That was believe. built with some of these same credits that... That one was did not use tax credits. Okay. That was no, a whole no, different right. setup altogether. We so if, if that was a know, nonprofit, and if we had, right. okay. we're okay. talking. I think it, so. I I started the conversation talking about low income housing tax credit um, possibilities because, as you will recall, we have that as a uh, an important aspect of downtown Columbia. So we have to be able to figure out how to make that happen. And I, and I agree. I'm, 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 as you know, as we've talked, I'm, I'm actually comfortable with making, you know, certain, uh, you know, potentially, you know, looking at certain amendments that could support things to a certain extent mm -hmm. under certain um, certain things. I still want to ask these questions, yeah. though. No, no, no. That's, I just. Uh, I mean, I, uh, so just, 
you know, trying to get, you know, trying to get the answer. And if you, I was wondering if you did have that data. I mean, you know, one of the other things is, you know, because of a fair housing laws, we can't also dictate that it's going to go to the teachers, the firefighters, or the people that are already working here. We can't dictate that either. Um, again, one of the reasons we, you know, work towards the live where you work program, where that's those dollars are now coming from employers and the nonprofit combined to then help, you know, uh, encourage that type of movement. But in the other cases, we're building it, and it doesn't mean that it's actually, you know, could just be people who now move from another county are still working in another county and just are coming here for the school. So, you know, there's nothing we can really do there. So I'm just trying to, I'm trying to understand the statistics you have available that would support, you know, really what you're saying, and then, um, and then any other, any other reason. It's even more of a concern for me, I guess, though, outside of you know, some things that we do have to address is it's already part of an overall plan with downtown Columbia. But um, if we weren't building anywhere else and that's all we're building, that to me is a concern. Um, so let me add to that. Um, you know, one, you could, you know, what is allowed is marketing. So you can certainly market your project heavily in the county, um, which can attract people and that is done. Uh, two, is it something else that we could- I'm sorry, I just didn't hear, to, I'm having trouble hearing you. Can you say that again? Uh, that you you can market your, you know, if you're building new affordable housing, you market heavily in the county. Uh, so you're looking to draw county residents that way. That is allowed. Yeah, right. And that um, has been that has been done. They've reached out to, you know, various groups. They they they've done that since before we were all on the council. <laughs> and, I, and I would add, if if we had uh, an exception that was um, uh, done in a somewhat looser way, in a way that would allow uh, mixed income developments to move forward. There are uh, a number of projects such as um, Monarch Mill and Burgess Mill that we did that um, were redevelopments that added um, sometimes some affordable units, sometimes no affordable units, but really just added market rate capacity. And so you're creating a mixed income development where you did not have that before. So that would be possible, again, if you had an exception for housing that served 40% of the total population at 60% of median or things like that. So how do we answer to other developers that aren't in that market that we're going to allow you to develop 150 market rate units and they're shut out? I can't. I I'm, mean, just, I, I'm just, at, I'm just, I think I'm, there's I'm, a, a. I'm just trying to understand that's, that, you know, how, how you would go about it, you know, from our perspective on that. I think what you're getting out of that is improvement to the affordable housing that's there. And so the answer is we're helping to promote better and more affordable housing. That's a county goal which is important and if not, you know, if not urgent. Um, and here's a way we can do an exception for that. So how do other jurisdictions around Maryland who have as restrictive or even more restrictive adequate public facility ordinances as it relates to school capacities or address your concerns? Uh, I don't know. I can't answer that. I can mm -hmm. look and get back to you. Thank you. That'd be helpful. I just wanted to, uh, under, since we're talking about it, I guess, I, I still am not sure I understand why we're delving into all this rather than going forward with the legislation we have. but. I'm trying to understand this opportunity areas, opportunity zones, opportunity areas. Communities of opportunity is how the state refers Communities to of opportunity. areas of opportunity. There are multiple so terms. Are we, and you're saying we're now qualified. Is that because we have, because of our residents needing the affordable housing or because we're seen as a receiving zone for folks who need affordable housing? Um, areas of opportunity are, are um, uh, are areas that are shown to um, be relatively well off, in essence, and that's what we are. So it so doesn't make you either are... necessarily receiving zone or um, that your residents have need. It's a it's an indication that it would be good as a way to help um, make sure that there's affordable housing in in areas that are, uh, you know, good schools, good jobs, um, good salaries, etc. Does that look at where there's already potentially a higher density of affordable housing and still has that on the map. I mean, one of the things I know we've tried to do is not increase, you know, concentration levels too high. Does it take off areas that have, you know, reached certain concentration levels? Um, so the, again, different definitions will vary with that. The Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership definition looks at concentrations, particularly racial concentrations, uh, more closely. Um, the state uh, definition is long and includes a whole bunch of factors. 
uh, and generally it, it, I think, focuses mostly on um, school scores, uh, incomes, uh, condition of housing and things like that. I don't, I could look back and get back to you on whether or not um, concentration is a factor in their score at all. Yeah, that would be something yeah. I think. What is the school score? I mean, I guess I'm trying to understand when you say a school score, how does, how does that work and is that impacted by the schools being overcrowded? Um, typically it's test scores. It's, okay. you know, how they do on the state assessment tests. Okay. <clears throat> so I guess I'm just going to express my personal concern about this just in terms of um, areas where we already have um, high density and high concentrations, higher concentrations of um, lower income students, higher numbers of farms that if we're just adding affordable housing or we're, we're, we're moving more folks in that area without the idea of having enough room in the schools for them, that what we're, what we're providing for them is, a, is less of an opportunity um, in terms of education. We're, we're providing crowded schools and, um, and not the resources then to deal with those crowded schools. That's my concern. You're, you're essentially exacerbating some of the challenges that we're already trying to work through. So I will uh, mention a couple things. One is that um, this, the potential impact of the legislation is not just in areas where you have concentrations now. It's in many other areas. And so we have a potential project of 60 units that is far outside of Columbia. Um, it would be half affordable, and we would not be able to proceed with that project. Is that in also, an open area? No. It's in a closed area, yeah. but outside of Columbia. Yeah, um, but, which is much of the map. And I'll also mention that tax credit housing typically serves people at close, you know, between 50 and 60 percent of the area median. The area median is over ninety thousand dollars for a family of four. So for a family of four, you're looking at people earning in the fifty thousand plus dollar range. For a family of three, it's in the forty thousand plus dollar range. Most of these are not farm families. Um, they are people with one job or multiple jobs um, who still are priced out of the county uh, at, the, at those income levels. I think what I'm hearing is um, not concerns about affordable housing per se. I mean, I, for one, am a strong affordable housing advocate, and most of the people who have been who have known me over the last dozen years, and the council knows that's the case, and I think my colleagues have um, taken some tough votes that um, were pretty pro-affordable housing over the years. I think what we're talking about is if we're looking at adequate public facilities and the infrastructure to move forward with development and then potentially only allowing affordable housing to move forward, how does that impact the state of affairs in our county and in particular particular neighborhoods? and the schools and, and so I think that's it's not that you know we don't want certain kids per se I think what it really is is that we want to make sure we have the appropriate public facilities and if we don't have the appropriate public facilities only moving forward with affordable housing isn't really going to be helpful I think yeah, that's what it, I'm ex ex exactly and I, I mean that's I, that was a concern I stated the other night um, you know I've, I've compromised on a number of things and, and have worked with Dr. Ball and a number of, of, of various things through the years, and you know, not like I want to take a. We, 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 I, was, I wasn't even sleepy yet. Um, could have saved that, um, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah, there we go. Um, I, I guess just trying to understand, especially like again, you're talking about you know in an area that's closed, and then also talking about market rate units that potentially. You know, somebody else is now also not, you know, getting, and, and we're going to allow in there. Um, I, I guess I, I just have a number of, of concerns around that. Well, and, and I, I don't envy your position. This is a tough issue. Um, I think uh, our point of view is that we are um, an incredibly uh, lucky county in many ways. You know, we're in great position, and somehow if we cannot provide adequate schools, and affordable housing. Those are both um, urgent needs of the county. And to 
they'll go with one and completely abandon the other um, is something we think we can do better than. And I know that's hard to do, and I know there are going to be some hard choices in there, um, but we do think that you wouldn't want to exclude affordable housing and make the affordable housing crisis worse, which this would definitely do, one at a time when the state could help us make it better in particular. Um, and two, just in general for those folks living here, and I know you want to see statistics on that, but certainly anything that drives up housing prices overall is going to impact that population disproportionately. And, and, and I do hear you. Um, not knowing all the various categories, I mean, obviously the stuff that's age-restricted still wouldn't be an issue because it would be exempted anyway. Um, is there, you know, what are the various other categories? Is there anything else that might be age-restricted that might have to do with um, that's, that would be supported by something like this that might be for developmentally disabled or something else that wouldn't necessarily impact, you know, schools to have, you know, a transitional, you know, for housing, you know, other housing stock that we could be able to support that market. Um, you know, is there, is there anything like that that's out there? And I guess, you know, and I guess because that's something I think I could also, you know, see supporting that's not impacting the school system at that point. Um, it's become increasingly difficult to do housing for specific populations under the Fair Housing Act. So if you do a, po a uh, development for people with disabilities, you can't say we just want this disability. It's anybody with disabilities. Right, but it could be from an age-restricted um, standpoint. Have well, you can do age-restricted housing. But, so is that it, would but be other possible. than senior, I mean, I guess, is there, is there anything else having to do with school-aged children side of things or not that's able know. to be done under that and, and potentially being mixed with senior population? You you know, so it's not can't. single. It's not single so, population. So, Mr. Fox, are you asking whether or not there's an ability to do a um, singles only? Uh, if you're talking extent. about, um, right? Extent. Well, it's. It, you clearly cannot distinguish on the basis of family nature. That's a straight up well, fair housing well, violation. Not, not okay. So we can't. Family. All right. Well, but you were thinking family well, when you were well, talking about disabled, when you were talking about being depends. willing to potentially do something like that. You're talking about family. Well, th right? this is an area, Ms. Siggy, that, that, that in the testimony on Tuesday that I, I, I was hoping to get a little bit more information on that is it was highlighted that there are a couple of jurisdictions looking at your testimony, your written testimony. I, I know you didn't get through all of it. <clears throat> but... Um, that other counties, other jurisdictions have had issues, the state has had issues, but it, it, are you able to uh, elaborate more specifically on those issues and appropriate mitigations that they have taken or were ordered to take, whatever, it, to, to address those? those Regarding issues? fair housing? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the fair housing issue is difficult because it always comes down to an individual case, but, um, you know, recently I appreciate the state, that clarification. I understand that. <laughs> the state has uh, had gone through this conciliation process, so they have, um, you know, published that conciliation, and uh, they are um, trying to now make sure they produce uh, affordable family housing in areas of opportunity. Baltimore County has recently gone through a similar process um, because uh, for many years, and I, um, this is hard to characterize, but uh, for many years the state plan allowed local governments to uh, approve or not approve a, um, a development uh, before it would get state funding. And for many years, Baltimore County had very, very few family affordable housing projects being built. So they are now working to remedy that situation. Um, there are others nationally as well, but uh, there was also a long-running suit against the city of Baltimore that was really much more about public housing and probably HUD. All right. So, so yeah. when you're others around the country, well, when you're talking about the state is working on new uh, criteria, regulations, whatever you, that are due out this spring, is that in response to yes. this conciliation process? Yes, that's directly Baltimore, in response. To that okay, process. and Baltimore County has are they also similarly in the process? They have not yet completed. Uh, their, I think they've re reached an agreement on what they're doing. And that's okay, out there, so they have uh, agreed to create units in, in various forms and various uh, areas of opportunity, essentially. Okay, so this is, is to Dr. Ball's point much earlier about uh, throwing something on the table for somebody to do. Um, it, um, t uh, it's a, if we can elaborate on exactly what Baltimore County has done uh, to address. And again, I understand that was specific to their, their situation, right. may not be a similar scenario, but it would be helpful to, to see some of the actions that they've taken right. to address we, conciliation. We I think, you know, where um, the difference is going to be that they're remedying a past problem. 
Sure, and we understand. would be for us, it would be potentially creating that problem. And, that's, so, and I appreciate that. That's the perspective, right? So what right. we're trying to do is learn from others' issues uh, to avoid making similar mistakes where we might find ourselves in that. Sure, I believe and, that. And we can. We we're trying to. I, I believe suggest. that's public. We can get that information. Yeah, no, I'm sure if it's been uh, if it's been implemented, it certainly certainly is public, and I, and I, and I appreciate. I appreciate any efforts that you, you want to take, and I, you know, I'm sure our staff and uh, others will, will help with that as well. I, I guess for me, <clears throat> it's important if these solutions are related to concerns that uh, are similarly situated. I think, again, and we may disagree, a stronger adequate public facilities ordinance relates to all housing. And so I think that's a little bit different than cases where, frankly, those jurisdictions targeted affordable housing and tried to uh, minimize them. I would, I would suggest that um, a more uh, stringent adequate public facilities ordinance will not target any particular type of housing. And so if you can find cases where that is the case, and that's why I asked about uh, jurisdictions that have, because we have jurisdictions that are at 100%. We have jurisdictions that have a seven-year waiting period. How are they addressing your concerns? I think to extend the Mr. question is to also, how are they not running afoul of the... But if we're going to start talking about that, I think the better source of that is our Office of Law. I mean, if we're going to look for cases, et cetera. And I'm not suggesting we have that here. If we need legal advice, maybe that's what we need to do. But mm -hmm. it seems to me that it, that would be a question for our Office of Law. And just to clarify, I didn't mean cases uh, as it related to the law. I meant cases related to examples of jurisdictions that are addressing these issues. So I apologize if that was unclear. So we can certainly try to get information from other jurisdictions that are, again, looking at, looking at these issues. Um, you know, I think you're right. From a legal point of view, it's unclear what a, a law like this that would stop all development would do. Uh, the Fair Housing Law um, Act does prohibit discrimination on the basis of family composition. And so a law that on, it fa on its face makes it much harder to do a for, um, family housing is not an affordable issue. It's just a straight up family issue. So there, there may be vulnerabilities there. And the other piece is that um, uh, you can violate fair housing for just a disparate impact on minority populations or other protected classes. So again, okay. even if it stops all housing, but that has a disparate impact on um, people's, people with disabilities or uh, racial minorities, it can be a problem. And again, I don't know how that would work. It would end up with a developer trying to do a project and saying, hey, look what this is going to mean. Uh, and then so that's why we just I think there's the some vulnerability jurisdictions there. and see. Sure. Um, and, yeah. and didn't the legislation, as it was passed, include um, make make some make affordable housing easier in some senses? I mean, I thought that it, that MIHs were exempt from allocations. Is that the? I believe that was the case. Is that yes? I'm seeing nods here. So. I, I mean, our legislation itself, on its face, actually makes affordable housing um, easier. Well, basically, what, it, and that, what you're saying is, in those cases, if that area is open and they're doing other housing, you're going to have the balance that's going to stay with the same balance. No, <laughs> it's no, not it based on the area. No, no, because no, no, you wouldn't have MIHUs being, you know, needing to be to be part of a project unless a project was being built, right? So it's keeping it balanced right, at that point. Right, but they're exempt from allocations under the bill as drafted. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with you and saying, and it's a good thing because it's keeping it's a it's a balance. It's, it's because it builds an entire project, project as opposed, opposed to one, a right. project that's and only an, affordable housing at that MI, point. Well, and an MIH, okay. you, I understand 50, where you're coming being, from. Yeah, you know, it's 15 percent versus right. 50 or 100. Um, so, if I might, we have. Besides Mr. Engel for the Housing Commission, we actually do have in the audience somebody with um, some significant experience in building affordable housing. So I'd like to ask if he has anything to add to the conversation. Mr. Howe from Enterprise. Um, I think it's important for us to at least understand how this, how it, how it works because I, it, 
mm -hmm. because. Oh, yeah. I and I agree with that. And my point was me merely in response to the fair housing oh, yeah. discussion and I'm that we actually, you. on its face, made it easier. I, we were, that, I was agreeing with you. I wasn't I disagreeing with you. I think that on its <laughs> face, Ms. Terraza, that there's an argument that could be made that our um, school's test actually runs afoul of the Fair Housing Act because the disparate impact there is that you are discriminating against familial status, which is people with children, because your test is based on whether or not you have children. If you can build because you can't have children at 55 plus, and you can't build based on but that's legal. We already know that if, that senior housing is legal. Well, I know that that I'm can just, be legally distinguished. Correct, from that. it can and, be. But I, I think that we, I think that there's been strides in in the way fair housing has been interpreted. Um, well, and as then well, we so. have a fee in lieu as well, which is I think further keeping. Um, I mean, if we're going to start talking about, I'm not sure our Office of Law wants us to do this, but if we're going to start talking about areas where the impact is on um, to um, further segregate the county, I think we should be reexamining our P and Lou. Okay, and, I don't and, disagree with you on that. But I anyway, would, I would venture to say that if that were the case, any capacity tests would. Um, potentially slow down development and have that same issue and concern and just about every jurisdiction has a capacity test. So I'm, I'm not sure I have the, that same level of concern that uh, there's a dip, disparate impact based upon familial status. I would agree. So, good luck. Other, county, other, other jurisdictions have, have made those kinds of decisions too. Mr. Howe, I just wanted you to talk a little bit, if you wouldn't mind, about from your perspective, given that this is what, what Enterprise does. And sure. Enterprise is um, a valuable piece of the Columbia heritage. So. I've heard that before. So. Uh -huh. um, we've, and we've, we've been trying to actually do a lot of work in, in Howard County. We've been in, in far more involved in the acquisition of properties than we have actually in developing new affordable housing properties in Howard County, so it's kind of been a shame, but um, uh, we'd like to have that opportunity, and, and we see with this coming up that maybe <laughs> that's not going to be an opportunity. And one of the things that, that Peter was bringing up, and I wanted to emphasize a little bit, the states, um, he mentioned COOs, Communities of Opportunity, which is not new um, in, the, in the state guide, but what is new about Community of Opportunity right now is uh, the settlement that he was talking about or the reconciliation um, that not only... Um, wants to point dollars toward communities of opportunity, which it clearly did in the last round. 18 of the 20 applications were in what was deemed as communities of opportunity. The only ones that got it outside of that were actually needed state priority points because they've tilted the scales so far to put housing in these areas. Uh, this one actually pushes it even further, not just communities of opportunity, but communities of opportunity within the Baltimore MSA, which focuses on Baltimore County, Howard County, Baltimore City, and Arundel County. So there's really a, 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 con a concerned effort to really locate these facilities in these particular areas, which gives Howard County a tremendous advantage. Um, and so with that, it would be a shame to miss that opportunity uh, because those dollars will go elsewhere, and it's dollars that aren't coming out of Howard County's coffers. There's dollars that come from the tax credit program and, and private investors to deal with the problem in Howard County. And I think I mentioned in my original testimony, and somebody had mentioned it's your numbers with regard to um, uh, people in need of affordable housing within the county itself. I think I testified the last time that 45% of the renter households within Howard County right now that live here are housing cost burden. And that means they're over 30% of their income, uh, some as high as even 70% of their income is being paid toward housing. So when you talk about what benefit, you know, when, when somebody goes from that burden to potentially in these tax credit developments, actually um, we restrict the rents to 30% of their income. So uh, at that point in time, that becomes more disposable income that can be used throughout the county. Um, maybe the residences they moved out may actually improve and do better things with it. So there's an overall domino effect that is um, uh, from an economic impact and from a beneficial standpoint to residents of Howard County done by affordable housing. Um, so that was that. Uh, I did also want to mention uh, Baltimore County settlement, if, in case you're, um, you'd mentioned some of the, I know a little bit about it, I don't know everything about it, but the settlement itself uh, was also a, a fair housing issue uh, that Baltimore County had not developed enough family housing. 
uh, Baltimore County's uh, uh, resolution of that issue was a, a, a settlement that required them to put up $30 million of their own money to produce roughly 1,000 units over the next 10 years within communities of opportunity in Baltimore County. So that's something where they're, they're pairing up with tax credits, but they're also doing other programs, but they're using their own dollars to be able to do that, whereas maybe under the current program or the state guide right now, uh, you wouldn't necessarily need to do that and address the issue before it becomes a worst issue like what Baltimore County's facing. Um, Thanks. Thank you. Is that good? Yep. Yeah, Dr. Ball. So did I hear you say that the primary targeted jurisdictions would be Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Anne Arundel County, and Howard County? Maybe Har Harford, Harford and Carroll. Harford, Queen Anne's. Is Queen, is Queen Anne's in as well? Okay. I'm going to say, and Carroll. But it's not throughout the balance Carol. of the state. And Carroll. Carroll as well, which Carroll has not done in affordable housing development ever. So <laughs> maybe well, a senior well, deal that's a long time ago. <laughs> well, I guess to that point, if you look at those jurisdictions, they're not all um, in the same place as it relates to affordable housing. And so I'm wondering if you if if there was an opportunity for affordable housing and one were to look at all of those jurisdictions, they're not all equally situated. You would agree with that, correct? I guess under what context, I'm not necessarily sure what you're asking. If someone were looking to build an affordable housing district, they wouldn't say Queen Anne's, Carroll, Howard, Anne Arundel, Baltimore County, and Baltimore City, all completely equal. I could go any of those places and everything would be exactly the same. As far they as an individual look looking for housing, is that the perspective no, you're building? Talking? A builder wouldn't look at all of those four, all of those jurisdictions and pretty much see that they're all equal. Uh, as a builder, I look in all those jurisdictions. And you so would see them all as equal? I don't know that I would see them as equal. I look for opportunities to be able to create housing in those jurisdictions and where those opportunities present themselves, then we explore them. And the factors that you would consider, mm -hmm. you think that in all of those jurisdictions, the factors are the same? I think that's kind of ambiguous. I'm not necessarily sure how I, I mean, there's no place is the same. I can't say that, you know, in Howard County, every place is the same either. Hmm. Well, let me try another approach. Okay. If, have you looked at the adequate public facilities ordinances of all those jurisdictions? I have dealt with whatever ordinances were in place in most all of them, but not all of them probably. And how does this one compare to each of them? Uh, each one of them is a little bit different and the mm -hmm. fee structures are a little bit different and mm -hmm. the situations are a little bit different. So, so if, someone were looking at, say, Anne Arundel and Howard because they're comparable as jurisdictions, um, income, what have you, and they saw that Anne Arundel had an actually more restrictive adequate public facilities ordinance than what Howard currently has, we wouldn't necessarily lose that opportunity to Anne Arundel, correct? I'm not necessarily sure when you say more restrictive because they say 90, they're at 100 percent or 105 that, the devil's in the details of that particular number and then how the jurisdictions actually determine what capacities are and how they make adjustments and things like that. You've got jurisdictions like Montgomery County, which will, deals with the same issue, but they tend to look at the schools really intensively and work out caveats and details so that they don't necessarily go over capacity. So I don't know if you can just look at a sheer number and say there's, mm -hmm. there's some equality between that because when, how they determine what capacity is in schools, how they determine disability students, how they determine how the use of their facilities are, all those things are different and I don't know that you can truly compare apples to apples. I think that's a fair point. How would you compare Council Bill 1 with the recently passed 95 percent in Anne Arundel County? What are the details that you would compare those with? I, I, I don't have all the specific details of it. Okay, that's fair. Thank you. Sure. Um, it, it, you mentioned Baltimore County and, mm -hmm. and their Whatever they had a con what a consent decree or what what was it or a conciliation what, agreement? Huh? It's called a conciliation agreement. Okay, so they didn't get to the point that that okay. So what what percentage of affordable housing were they, you know, building? Did they you know what's their you know, they have an MIHU requirement? They do not. So so going. And they don't to, have an adequate public facilities or right. Or but so going to us as far as in you know concern compared to another county, if we're sitting you know with our MIHU requirement plus we still have been doing. Mm -hmm. other affordable housing, you know, through through tax credit programs, I, w I would think that a percentage uh, above that isn't going to really be required on, you know, I don't think we're really going to be getting hit uh, at the federal level at that point. I mean, I I'm just trying to understand how that, how we could be running afoul, and if we're not building other units at that point, our percentages aren't changing. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure where the concern is. 
I think, you know, again, the concern is that you have a, a, a law that says you can build senior housing but not family housing. And that okay, so, so you're just going on the senior housing only. Discriminating uh, on the basis of family status. But that, but that, goes, to, that goes to the entire affordable, that goes to the entire APFO. It does. But that's, I mean, so. so it, right. <laughs> However, if you look at how that would be enforced, you know, what, if somebody's suing on that basis, you know, who your likely plaintiff's going to be, Again, it's going to depend on a specific case, and there's a secondary piece about um, uh, disparate impact on uh, people with disabilities and minorities. So I can't tell you that that would be a winning case at all. I'm not trying to say that. All we're trying to say is that this is, I think, an area of, of concern as the bill as it is going. Um, and I'd mention a couple of things quickly. One is that, um, Dr. Wall, it seems to me the comparison you're looking for with Anne Arundel County may be best done on maps and what those maps look like. I don't know what the Anne Arundel County maps look like, but I'll see if we can get them, because that is some way of telling as to if you're trying to develop, is this, how much of the county is open for development or not, regardless of what the school percentage is. I think um, what Mr. Howe is saying is that those get implemented differently. So I don't know if we can track those down, but I'll, I'll try to do that and see if we can get to that. Yeah, but I, I guess I view the world a bit differently. Um, I, I feel as though we've, we've seen a lot of maps since we look like we were going to pass this legislation, since we passed it, that I think, frankly, have been sometimes used as scare tactics. And I'm less concerned with how red a map is, and I'm more concerned with the policies that we can implement as it relates to the Adequate Public Facilities Ordinance and looking at other jurisdictions and those policies and how those policies have manifested themselves and how they have... Um, been viewed as it relates to fair housing law. We can't, you know, change a map. And as Mr. Fox had alluded to earlier, there are several other aspects and players when it comes to a map, whether it's redistricting, building a school, there are lots of different factors. However, what we can control is the APFO. And I think if we're looking at these particular bills, what I would like to hear from people and I think you guys have done, at least some of the advocates have done a better job at least giving me concrete recommendations. Exempt this. You know, I, I, on the fiscal side, I thought it was a little bit more um, squishy. But at least you guys have been giving us concrete recommendations we can consider. And I think that that's reasonable for us to think about. Well, I, I hear you, and we will see what we can find on Anne Arundel County and how that comparison works out. Um, and the last point I would make is that... Um, the concern about affordable housing is that even if you do this, you know, the, the number of units of new affordable is a drop in the bucket in the county. We'd be lucky, from my point of view, with advocating for affordable housing anyway, to get 200 units a year in the entire county. That would be, that would be a pretty big uh, benefit from the state. So it's just not, yeah. a, it's not a large number overall in any case. I don't see it really moving the needle and impacting from an APO standpoint, but the impact it will have on lower-income residents within this county will be tremendously significant. So that's 200 if they're if in a building that's 100 percent of um, LHTC I, I mean, or that's... I think, you know, if, if we were lucky, we would win two projects at the state in their round, and each of those projects tends to be under 100 affordable units. But I thought the so. discussion we'd had, at least when we voted, before we voted in November, was about mixed-use projects. And that the whole point of this discussion was that the projects can move forward if we move the, the LHTCs into that, the, if we exempt them from the schools test. I thought that was sort of, is that not, I mean, that, that was what the amendment was. So then if you're talking about 200, you're talking about really 400? People. No, I think if that's the exemption, that's what it would go for, and so those projects would have fewer units. I, what I'm saying is that the most you would get ever out of the state would be, you know, in that number of affordable for the, units. You but mean if for we're the, setting different limits, then you'd have different You're limits. talking about for the 4 percent? 9 percent. Sorry, the 9 percent. Nine, nine but the 4 percent, is, is that limited, or is that are we likely to get more of the... Typically, that's rehabilitation of existing units, so you're not creating any additional density. So 4 percent is usually a rehabilitation or a preservation tool. And are those 200 likely to be in the same school district? No. I mean, that would be, especially I mean, if, if we're limiting it to, to smaller projects, they would be wherever you would go with but them. But I thought and you I talked, we were talking about two projects of about 100 or less than 100. That, what I was saying was that that would be the, what the state maximum you'd be likely to get. I think if we're talking about limiting that differently, you'd probably end up at 
you're unlikely to win three projects. So A, the number is lower, and B, they'd be scattered wherever you get them. And, and very unlikely to be in the same school district because you just don't have those development opportunities. But, well, okay, you're saying yeah, you're only likely to get two or three. They're like to, likely to be 200 between those two or three. And all the people in one building have to be in the same school district. So if it's one building, you're right, but I didn't say three, I said two. Two, And I okay. said that um, okay. if we're setting limits that are smaller than that in terms of what's acceptable for the total number of units, then we won't get 100 affordable units in a building. We'll get whatever that limit is. There's also, there's also a cap on the 9% tax credit, and it's capped at 1.5 million, which tends to put a governor on the size of these deals. So um, you're generally seeing most deals be in the range that Peter was describing because you just can't. You can't support it with the tax credit. Of less than, of around 100 or less well, than 100. Well, typical 9% family deals are about 75 to 80 units. Yes, it used to be 100, but construction costs, since I've been in the business, have gone one direction. And, and the state's cap on tax credits has remained the same for quite mm -hmm. some time. So uh, what's happened is the projects tend to get a little smaller. So and that's per project. And I think you're thinking about the concentration. It's not the concentration. It's per deal, per application. So one application could have 75, 80 units of affordable, but it, the other ones could be spread out throughout the county. So you're not, we're not talking about 200 concentrated in one area. Correct. But well, you're talking well, about maybe 75. Well, potentially, I was going to say Columbia. Some of those right. projects, I think, are bigger. So I guess, you know, yeah, I thought there was so, so when you're saying you get limited to 75 to 100, I think some of those projects are 150 to 200 right. or so, if I'm trying to remember now. And I guess it would be one thing. And then the other is, how would some of these other efforts outside of the stuff that's sort of planned and something we've already been through with Columbia play into this? Yeah, you know, as far as what you guys, what other, you know, players like yourselves would be looking at, you know, when there's already some, some other you know, ones that are part of the plans that, you know, we have anticipated already. I can't, I can't speak with, with what Howard Hughes is doing with, uh, with our affordable well, it's not just to Howard Hughes. Well, it's actually it's the Housing Howard, Commission. It's, it's, it's commission. actually, yeah, it's, a, it's a, you know, right. So, so but I'm sorry, going to Enterprise on okay. this question. But, sorry. But, um, you know, what, what you guys would be looking at when some of those things are already happening as part of the plan for downtown Columbia, whether they are through, how, have, how, whether Howard Hughes is a part of them or not, because it's the Housing Commission in most right. cases. So, so, you know, I, I think that's, you know, I guess my other question. I don't know what tools they'd be using, but like I said, uh, on a 9% competitive round, the tax credits are limited to uh, $1.5 million, which over 10 years is potentially a $15 million project. So that's, that's going to put a cap on the size, but I don't know how, how they implement that and, how, and whether they're even using that program for what well, they're planning on doing. So let me ask you, Tommy. The Housing Commission, since they're here, I mean, that's them. Well, well, I was more. I was well. Obviously, it doesn't like, impact. It doesn't, it doesn't impact. Anyway. It doesn't impact. It doesn't it's, impact them necessarily the same way it's going to impact. Why? No, why? but, but why? it was well, a good. No, no, we're no, giving no, you credit no, for a good far, question, Mr. Fox. Can we just let Mr. Engel weigh in on it? Because, uh, I mean, I, using your question, I'd be interested in okay. his answer. Because if I understand the question, That's the fine. impact on downtown relative to what was planned and what the commission was going to do and what might have to change because of this, this uh, legislation. Right. So it would not impact the Toby's redevelopment because that's already been approved. It would not impact the planned development of the Banneker Fire Station because that is an age-restricted project. And my understanding is the new library site is part of the Howard Hughes plan that's already been approved. So at, th at this point, it would impact the old library site and the transit center site, and those sites could not proceed. But you mean they couldn't proceed for a period of years? Right. That's not that they can't proceed. Anyway. They, yes, I don't mean to be those telling you what your legislation does. I, those right. aren't I agree with you that, that they could not uh, un, uh, until you were to wait through the, you know, apply, et cetera, wait through. And the do you know what the timing is on the, what, what was the anticipated timing on yeah. those projects? They're years but, out. So yeah. Okay, so they're not, years out. So they're not, they're they're not starting until so 25, we're not, we're not, perhaps. That's so. why I wasn't necessarily asking. I was, that's why I was more asking. Enterprise, because you're, they're talking about the near-term stuff and, and dollars that might be available. And, you know, and, and if there's already, those units are already being taken up or are going to the fact that we're only talking a couple hundred units a year, we're already talking a couple hundred units a year, right? I mean, you know, or 100 units maybe on average from some of those, from some of those developments. But let me ask from a timing perspective as far as, so usually, you know, we end up seeing these, you know, for, as they ask for payment in lieu of taxes, you know, coming to us at, at some point. 
is there a point before that that you need to know, I guess, that you're going to have those approvals to move forward, um, you know, as far as from a um, whatever, an allocation standpoint? Do you need to know before you're getting that, or would you be getting that at the same time? I don't think you would go to the state if there was a if you didn't know you could build. If you get your tax credits, you need to be able to build. And the uh, only reason I'm asking is, you know, can I talk about the thought that you know? Yeah. The, so mm -hmm. one of the thoughts was it's, it's one of the ideas that I've been talking to other people to check to right. see if it works. Yeah, right. Okay. So, right. So I, right. I talk, you know, as I talked to to Chairman Sigety, you know, about this and like we're, you know, she pushes hard, of course, on this issue. It's one of her her big ones. And so looking for ways to, you know, find compromise and everything else, you know, one of the thoughts, and maybe with some additional caveats to it, was a actually having that be something that then comes before the council at that time based off of whatever else is going on and understanding, you know, that importance, not making it something that's definitively a go or something that's definitively a no-go, but basically something that would have to then get council approval at that point to go forward, um, and whether that might whether that would even be feasible um, as a solution. If if that's the case, you would want that approval very early in the process before you've probably fully fleshed out your how project early? and before you've applied for the tax credits. So how so how I guess for me years ahead and you know and everything else you know I guess I'm just trying to understand timing wise where where, where does that. Can I ask a question yes, that ahead. might help with the answer that I think he's looking for? Um, I think what he's trying to uh, ascertain is whether or not there's a point at which the council would make an affirmative decision in relation to a project that would move it forward. And he was thinking about, he and I had talked about um, a payment in lieu of taxes, right? The council has to approve a payment in lieu of taxes. And so the question becomes, is there, is there a point where the council could make that decision that would then move the um, project to its application phase so that if it got its credits, it would know it would be able to go at having after, having after having an affirmative vote of the council, and then it would go through its application process knowing that it could utilize those, um, that, uh, those credits, if it if they if they were awarded. So, uh, Ned, correct me if I'm sort of off on the timing here, but I think the way this would work is, let's say the state tax credit round is in March, so you would need to come to the council probably at the end of the previous year to get that approval. Your project is still coming together at that time. You're running your numbers. You're making sure you have your land tied up for that time. You're sort of pulling things together, you probably don't have good architectural renderings, but you have a concept and you have a rough number of units, probably a number of units and probably an affordable number of units, um, and you come to the council then, you would then get that approval at the end of the year, you go to the tax credit round following March, get an approval sometime in the summer, late spring, complete your closing sometime in the March of the following year and take another year to build. So that's roughly how that would run. I think that's possible it's going to you would be making a decision on fairly limited information at that time it's sort of difficult but it's better than the alternative which is trying to get that approval after you know if you have to go to the state first they're going to have a lot of trouble approving a project which has this completely discretionary approval down the road on whether it's a go or no go at all so so, so I was going to say so we we could still potentially still do that as a two step though where the tax credits, we would not be doing an affirmation on the tax credits until like the project comes forward with all that information. And I guess, as, you know, for me, I'm just saying, I, you know, I'm not a huge fan of, of this, but I'm, again, looking for a, a compromise is, you know, I could see, and I just want to toss it out there. You compromise know, may I with just, who? With, with, from, a, from a community perspective, as far as looking at the issue. I, mean, and, I think we came up with a compromise and we voted on it November 6th. Uh, you know, uh, and <clears throat> so I'm trying to figure out who you're compromising with. You know what, Jen? I'm 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 just saying that as far as not all the issues, you know, had been brought up. You know, you got the direction. You you know exactly. You know, you know what you wanted, and that's fine if it goes exactly that way again. I'm, that's that's fine. It is what it is. 
I mean, it'd been nice if you had voted against some of the, you know, some of the, the presidential units that you supported throughout the 10 years before, so some of this wouldn't have been an issue, but we are where but we I are. I did vote against um, Fee and Lou every single time. So, so, so I understand that, but that's one, one small piece of it. Hmm. And, um, it. And so, again, that would have just been more units, too. But um, <laughs> so, again, to, I don't to even the point. understand but, what you're saying, but okay, go but, ahead. But, um, is something where it, it came before the council, but it couldn't happen if it was an area that that uh, already had a high concentration. However, that would be determined, and still couldn't be in an area that had certain levels of overcrowding, regardless of making the exception. If something like that could be developed, I'm not going to be the one working on it. Um, I'll toss out those general ideas because if it doesn't go <laughs> forward, I'm not worried about it going forward. Um, but uh, you know, I, I'm tossing that out to colleagues as a concept that could be something that could be amenable to, to folks as a way and, you know, it, we still, there's still a way to throttle it, uh, even that, because still say no. Um, so, but it's, it's also understanding that there's other pieces and things that are out there that, you know, let's say Toby's hadn't been approved and that was already part of something that we had going and we needed to get it done and we just said no. Is that what we want to be in that position? You know, I, I'm just asking that question. So I certainly think that having a process, I don't think we should be making an exemption. But if you're going to make an exemption, if you're compromising with some folks who are going to make an exemption, I certainly think a process is helpful. I guess what I would say is we need, like, what would the criteria be for a future council? Mm -hmm. And how, I mean, I, I think we need to talk to the school board about what that looks like in terms of predictability in the schools because I think that's, I mean, when you're talking about exempting them out of the school's test, that is, I think, the huge concern. And, and I frankly think, you know, based upon Mr. what Mr. Engel said, I'm not sure if we're setting up a future council for success if, you know, a year or two or three from now, there's this pilot that comes in with, as you uh, suggested, limited information and the community is asking for much more detail and the council's asking and then the developer's frustrated because they can't give you more information because they're so early in the process and then the council's like, that was that last crazy council that uh, said we could hear it but we don't really want to hear it and then the community's saying, well, well, where are the details? I, I'm not sure if that sets everybody up for success. I'm not saying, you know, it's an impossible idea. I don't, I, 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 I definitely yeah. hear your concern there too. I mean, I, I go to what, you know, Mr. Russ said would be, you know, that process and those in the, you know, still having some parameters around it. Um, I would agree with that. Well, I don't have any more questions on this topic. This, these folks are, I have questions on this topic for other folks. Okay. Thank you. I don't have, yeah, we'll go on these. Hey, Mr. Russo, who would you like to Well, I would like to talk to the Board of Education. I want to understand how the planning would work um, if we start exempting units because I think folks know I've been very supportive of affordable housing, too, over the years. My concern is that the impact exempting them would have on our school system. Now, you guys have had experience with certain areas being exempted from either APFO or the school's test, I guess the school's test. Can you talk about it? I think Hill Valley stands out as something that has been a major issue that I think uh, we found out during redistricting um, and why we decided to move some, some polygons where stuff hadn't been built because um, Manor Woods is way over capacity and Turf Valley is contributing to that. So that would be one, one issue that, that stands out a lot in my mind. Do you have concerns about sort of the predictability for the school system if we start exempting some units or types of projects out? If there's not consistency and there's a double set of rules, I, I mean, as a data person, it, I think it does make it difficult. Um, I would ask Ms. Kamen um, what her thoughts were 
as well, um, as far as if there are different rules for different areas. But Ms. Damaswell has a comment, Well, too. no, I mean, again, consistency is very helpful and predictability is very helpful. And that's where we get, um, that's where we end up with our problems. Because if you're going to exempt, let's just take, for example, if we're going to take these particular units and we are going to be exempting them from the school's test from our perspective, which is not housing, but is educating those children who come into our doors, that if we're cre if the challenge is the exemption is creating an inequitable experience for those children and the education experience that they're going to have. For example, a lot of these locations are going to be in areas where there already is overcrowding. So what we're doing is we're adding on to the problem as opposed to addressing the underlying issue, which is we don't have the seats where we need to have the seats. And we're almost creating, and I don't even like saying this, a different class for these students versus other students in the county because knowingly, because these units don't exist right now. Someone somewhere, be it the developer or the county, is going to make a decision based on factors as to where to locate these units. So if you're already locating the units where we don't have the capacity, you're continuing to add to the problem. So the question becomes, and this is more your wheelhouse than our wheelhouse, is that when you're citing these, when you want to cite these units, are there better locations to cite them based on the school criteria? Because as we all know, people move here for the school experience, for their kids. Everybody wants their child to have a better experience than they did. And we, and we want them to have that. But if we have these constraints, and we're already in the hole, so to speak, and now we get more kids, it's, it's not fair for those children. And I know life isn't fair, but from our perspective, we want to make sure that the, in, the education environment for our students is the same, no matter where they are in Howard County. That's a fair point. I think that's a fair point. The problem with that fair point, from my perspective, is that it only looks at education. And we have um, a very strong, or we at least tried to have a strong commitment to affordable housing. And so we have to balance supplying a, a quality education to our children and providing affordable housing. And I am, having, I am actually having a hard time with what you said because it is exclusionary. You've said, what you've said is education is the only thing we have to, we have to consider. No, I no, no. think in this, well that's what I heard, what? right? That's what I heard. What and I so was saying, I am having a hard time with how do we now balance affordable housing with education? Okay, what I meant was when I said that we have to consider, I am, I am dealing with we as the Board of Education. Our lane is education. We need to stay in that lane. However, affordable housing and great schools are not mutually exclusive. But I believe in order for us to get there, we may, have, we may have to change the way that we're doing business and the way that we are approaching this as a county, which brings a whole other different discussion. I agree with you. I totally agree with you. We need the affordable housing. But you have to ask yourself if the decisions as to where we're deciding where to put this affordable housing, if that act in and of itself is creating a disparity for the children who are moving into that housing, is there a different way for us to do this? And that could be us saying, okay, down, I'll use downtown Columbia as an example. All right, we're gonna have an influx. This is where we wanna put it for a variety of reasons. For transportation, there are other non-school reasons as to why you wanna put affordable housing where you choose to put it. But that being said, how do we set those students up to succeed? And that comes to us, the Board of Education. And for us, that would be to make sure we have the best possible education experience for that child. And what we're finding is that capacity is part, a very important part of that equation. So we don't have taxing authority. We just, so we need, we need that relationship. With we don't you want as, it either. And we don't want it. <laughs> we, trust me. So we need that And I guess you're going to have to deal with affordable housing, too. And you're going to have to deal with other things. 
right? The bottom line, the, the bottom line, and it's my turn, is that we have to balance both. The state law that gives us the ability to actually create an affordable or an adequate public facilities ordinance, it's not, it's not an or, or affordable housing, it's an and. But that's what we can do under state law. So I'm troubled as you sit there and basically tell us that we are not, that affordable housing is not as important as educating our children. I am she, not, she with all due respect, no, that Madam Chair, I'm not saying, saying that. that. I am in no way saying that. I am saying that there is a relationship. It is, there are many different things that we as a county and the citizens in this county value. We value education. We value, we value everyone having a fair share. We want people to be able to succeed. And part of that is education and a part of that is, is affordable housing. They're not mutually exclusive. What I'm saying is when we make these decisions because it is our responsibility is the education piece of this, we want to make sure that we can set these students up for success to have the best possible education environment. How we get there, there is a multitude of different ways for us to do it, and I think that bears a deeper discussion. So we're not saying that we shouldn't have affordable housing, and we're not saying that we take precedent. We're saying from our perspective, this is our responsibility, and we want to make sure that we can execute our responsibility for each and every child in this county in an equitable way. So that's what I'm, and, so and I apologize if you misunderstood. And, and I, Fox. So, so in terms, Chairwoman Sigley, again, you know I'm trying to find a way to, but I think, I think she does, you know, bring up some very valid points in, in what you're saying, and I do not believe you said, I think, you know, it was just taking the education perspective, it wasn't one over the other. I don't, I did not hear that. Um, and, you know, I think it is, you know, it's also a fair point with these tax credits and other things that are there that there, there could be more flexibility in the properties that they're able to locate and acquire and they know what our maps are just as well as anybody else does and therefore. And there's only so much land left, isn't uh, there? Yeah, un understood, mm -hmm. I, I, I understood. Um, and again, I'm not saying that there's not a way to, to still look at some of those things for, for exactly that reason, but I mean, those are also, you know, fair points as well. And, and when you we talk about affordable housing, and again, this is, as you know, this is my, my concern since day one, and I've stated sort of to a certain extent this earlier, you know, when it comes to trying to support those that are already in this community, we can only support who we can, you know, there's only so much stuff you can support, there's only so many dollars. And if, if from my perspective, anybody that's already, you know, in the community, that's our, our priority one. And the thing is with these, with the affordable housing programs based off the fair housing law, we don't get to pick and choose if it's helping people in, in this community or not. It's not something that we, we, we are getting to choose. So it very well could be helping nobody in this community and, and when, when some of these projects are approved, because that's what actually has happened before. It not, hasn't gone to people who already live here or already work here. Um, in many cases, is people who now, be, be, you know, now go to work, you know, become, you know, are still working wherever else they're working and are now coming here to live in the county. Um, it's been very small percentages. It's been some, you know, that have actually worked here and then now could live here. And then, you know, going forward, I'd have to go pull the old data from old emails from Mr. Carbo, unless we have some updated data. But, you know, many times, the, you know, I'd get the units as far as where people, where they were beforehand. You know, and they weren't here. You know, most of them were not living or working in the county, but so wanted to Mr. come here. Fox. Hold on, and then when they looked at it a couple of years later, they didn't necessarily stay working in the county. So, Mr. Fox, you and I can take this argument into the office afterwards. But I am going to I'm say, I'm going to go grab dinner afterwards. Right. I'm going to but, grab dinner afterwards. But I am going to say, and I think this is really important, and this is where I find the fallacy in all of this: the request to shut down development to the level that is being requested is going to cause, is going to make a huge change in the market that runs and it's going to increase the cost of housing across the county. And therein, we are going to lose affordable housing. So we are making a choice for less affordable housing when we make this choice. You're talking overall, independent of a decision having to do with the tax credit program. I'm talking across I'm, the board. I'm, I'm not, dis I don't disagree with you there. And, but I, Therein as well is as, the as, root of it, so well as, that if we, if we do one 
and we're going to cause housing to go up, we are not doing something that we could that counterbalances it. So anyway, I'm going to stop. Ms. Terrasa, yes. I'm not even sure where to begin, but I want to, uh, I, go ahead, Mr. Weinstein. No. Okay. Um, so just to, to break down some practical terms here, um, and, and Mr. Engel, just you can do it by nodding. Um, you talked about um, uh, blink. <laughs> All right, folks, I know we're getting on in time here, but uh, so the, the project or projects you're talking about, you know, max of uh, one or two uh, of about 75 units, is that about one and a half million, if I remember the number, would yield about a 75 unit project? Is that, is that about right what you're talking about? That would be a typical project. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just looking for typical at this point because we're just everything's just all speculative. I'm sorry. Uh, I guess in case there's a follow-up here. So, so looking at that, and so to, uh, turning to our friends in the school board in terms of planning and predictability and things like that, um, uh, this would come to us in December. Let's just pick, you know, December of 2019. Uh, they would get approval or begin to construct in March of 2021, if I understand the progression. So you'd come to us December 19 for an approval. There'd be an approval. If it were approved, then in March, you would go and request the funds from the school, from the state. State might approve it and say, you know, the summertime, just to give you time. Then um, you would have to start building by March uh, of the following year, which now we're into 2021. Is that correct? Yes, roughly. Just roughly. Obviously, I mean, maybe you make it by the end of the previous year. Maybe it's a little later. But December. You could be as early as December of, of twenty. Likely the after. But the, a year is typical. So. Year is typical, and then you'd have to complete that project by March of twenty two. So, to the school board folks, so I understand these would be exceptions from perhaps the more long term planning that you get with uh, the standard process we have here. Uh, and in taking a 75-unit apartment building, it's yielding uh, 13 children, okay? Eight at the elementary school level, three at the middle school, two at the high school level. Um, is that enough time between the time it would be for, sorry? I'm just using whatever he's, the current, he's using the current yield, yield numbers. For right. 75. Uh, units, yeah, apartment units. I, I'm, I, we're using an apartment building as, a, as, a, as, a, as an example. Um, I mean, the yields are a little bit higher for town assets, but we are clearly not talking about single-family homes. Um, so that, uh, that would be time that you would be able to determine how to address the increase, you know, no, assuming that other development wasn't occurring. Uh, and then that would be because what I, the time frame I gave you would be a time frame in which this re severe restriction in, in development would be taking place, the 22 to 20. Uh, time frame. So, is that is that something that, in the occasion that it may occur once to twice in a year, that that is something that you could account for? And again, this would be in a, an area that would be closed. And looking at the charts that we were given by Ms. Caymans, um, these are in regions, in many of the regions that it might occur where there are a number of schools that are open, but perhaps that particular school where the development was occurring would be closed. And obviously the elementary school would be the bigger of the issues because it's eight kids as opposed to three or two. So I just, in that scenario, is that? Well, I mean, the, ch the challenge we, we have um, is that nothing else is be, it would be static. It right. would be, we would be putting, we would be dump, I don't want, placing this development, this development sure. would be and somewhere the would children be would be coming people out. Moving into resales, at right? All and and you know, thing, and right? we have those mm -hmm. other things going on. And then you know, the other issue is, well, is the area closed? Well, how close? How closed would the area be? Right. That so would if we be were another have, piece of it. So right. unfortunately, as I think everyone in the whole county now has a much um, larger appreciation for, is that there are a lot of moving pieces. Oh yeah. To this, and. It's almost like you know you have a balloon and you push one end and you end up with bulging in the other yep. end. So there, and because there, there's a finite, there are a finite mm -hmm. number of state seats. Sure. So of course, lead time is important, 
but that also depends on what else is going on in the county. So we can't right. say to you, unfortunately, because life is the way it is, we can't say, oh, if A happens and it's going to go to B to C to sure. D, it's not going to. So if we were to be, if we were in the process of having a public hearing, I appreciate it. that's good, good information. It goes to it goes to your process and your thinking. So, if we were to have a hearing in in public hearing in December of nineteen on this project, and y are you saying you would not have enough information about the other factors to give a, a generally uh, a comfortable assessment to the council at the time to say this would have a significant impact, a moderate impact, or no impact uh, in our planning. Well, we would appreciate and we think it would be very helpful for us to have the opportunity to have the dialogue at that point in time. And sure. I think that would be very, very important. Right. And then yeah. once we would have that, then we could have the discussion. Because for ex I'll use the Turf Valley example. With that, what we've done is we looked at where there was going to be future development and we were able to take those polygons and move them to somewhere where we would have a where, where we believe mm. we have a decent predictability right, okay. of where there's going to be capacity now the thing that works better in turf valley that than would for example in a downtown columbia is that we have more capacity when you go west of turf valley we don't again we're going down to mm -hmm. downtown columbia and the other challenge that we have as a, as a whole county is that the revitalization areas in the eastern part of the county where we want to do the revitalization are the areas where we have the biggest capacity problems. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we know we've got the problem over here, but on the other hand, when we're looking at the growth of the county and for a multitude of other reasons why it would be good to have that revitalization, there is that impact on the schools. So, And how do we know that there's only one project? What if there are other ones that are able to come up that are financed through somebody else. You know, what if Enterprise and the Housing Commission decide to do something concurrently? Sure. Well, I mean, they would come to us at the same time. Right. Or, or if they came to us, or if they came to us independently, the one yeah. that might be there gets approved, the other one doesn't. Right. right? I mean, yeah. I mean, or, my question would be: Do we have a legal a problem with that? <laughs> like, what would be our justification for approving some and not others? Going back to if they, they could say, hey, you know. This we can't absorb, and this you know well, that's different. Additional incremental we right. can't. I mean, you're, you're not. Are you saying that in the same specific area, the same school? Yeah. Or? Okay. Yeah. yeah. If they if they were both, um, you know, where enterprise wants to to redevelop um, the and revitalize the community homes mm -hmm. in Columbia, mm -hmm. um, west of the mall, west of the mall. Um, you know, if those all got approved at the same time, and didn't have any any test, they could be, you know, Harbor's Choice is overcrowded and Wild Lake will be overcrowded because of downtown mm -hmm. Columbia. Um, so there could be multiple things happening. Right. So no, if, I, they, I and if, if they all right. happen at once, then right. we don't have adequate time to prepare because the, the timeline has been shortened. Right. Well, and that's a very point, important Mr. point. Fox, that if, uh, if that were to occur, then, you know, there might be, if there is an issue with the, with legal, they might may both have to be, might be decision for both and not they're either both going through or neither are going through right, right. and right. that goes and back to also could i just say for a second we, the 75 estimate i understand that was mis, what mr engel saying and i don't doubt wherever he oh there he is that he has a lot more expertise in this than than me but just in terms of the actual plan for downtown columbia has buildings of 150 200 and 300 so that's what those that's buildings what would be too. they wouldn't be 75 I'm sorry. Right. Uh, I think Mr. Angle also indicated that the ones that are most likely to be done in in the recent, in the foreseeable future approved. are all approved and, and have everything. So yeah, and I don't remember the timeline off the top of my head of those next projects, the transit center, which is way out, if it even would be affected by the 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 period of the of the restrained development, right? Well, we have no idea, do we? We don't, no, absolutely. And so we have no idea. I right. think that's also important to note. I mean, we can we can think about what could potentially happen in the next eight years, but we also have no idea when a future council will choose to make changes to APFO. Absolutely. We certainly well, in, heard in from a lot of people that we hadn't done it for a very long time. Right. So do we leave it? So we don't know. Sure. No, and there will be another, likely another APFO in that time period as well. So another review. So... Um, so yeah, to your extent, to the extent we do not know, but there are certain things to what Dr. Ball just said. We have mm -hmm. we we know what's going to go forward because it's already been approved. 
uh, in downtown, uh, and that there's a, uh, a process for the state right now to approve certain types of projects. So the question is, what is the likelihood of those projects getting approved and at what size and scale? And so that's all. I was just trying to come up with a scenario since uh, – our, our friends who were here earlier on the economic side, we didn't have a chance to run through scenarios. I figured I'd give one a try that we could actually do math about. So, and well, now they can see it on on reruns and figure it right. out for us. No, but I'm I sure do appreciate go. the the, in, the your insight on the process and what you would consider. I mean, it's it's helpful. And and also, yeah. I'd I'd like to point out that our CIP process is an ongoing process, but it does try to project obviously sure. years out. Right. Right. Um, and so, um, now it's getting built. Right, it helps to get new buildings built uh, and, and or renovations and additions to existing facilities. Mm -hmm. um, and so that planning is aided by the, the predictability mm -hmm. of, of being able to have, you know, uh, developments that are years and years out and they're right. not coming online immediately because they, are, they do have to go through at least the four years. Right, right. And I think it's a good point. I mean, what we're talking about here is a, a change to the environment, the AFO environment here in the county in, in total, right? And so everybody's making adjustments, including those who want to build things. Mr. Engel came here saying that, you know, this is sort of what they would be going after uh, in this environment and whether or not that would work. I mean, if it ends up that there are no amendments and he has to live within the constraints that are currently proposed, he'll have to make adjustments and whether he can actually accommodate additional housing units with those adjustments, you know, we don't know right now, but, uh, you know, that's sort of, they might be more inclined to look for areas where either they're open schools or that right. they are barely closed. That might be a change in behavior that we, we might see. So. But, and that also, um, I know, personally speaking, as the mother of a, of a student at a Title, at title I schools, um, you know, when the recession happened, uh, there were issues where uh, there were, three moms living across the street from Running Brook that moved in together to save money and they had seven children. And Running Brook went from being at 100% to being 125% within you know, a couple years. Um, and so there's, there's not just the new buildings, but there's also you know, business cycles that can exacerbate right. uh, the, the, um, the school projections as well. So you know, we're, we're planning out like everything is, is stable, but you also have to think about if the business cycle right, changes absolutely. where recession, um, we where may recession occurs, for another where, one, yeah. you know, the people decide to move in together to save right. costs, and then that completely changes, and Running Brook got an addition. All right, and one, so. I think, I mean, you guys, I'm sure, are paying close attention to what's going on in Carroll County, where they, they invested a lot in schools, and they're closing it. Mr. Yeah. Gist is here, and I can't imagine how unhappy he'd be to fight through the process of and building schools. And I will tell you that, that I have offered have to, to maybe, you know, buy one of those high schools. If we could. Know. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, I have made friends with my uh, County County. colleagues. And, although they actually, um, you know, again, in, in the way that you don't think things are going to happen necessarily, they had an increase in enrollment. Sure. So right. they had had decreasing enrollment, but then, mm -hmm. whoop, something changes. Sure. Right. Except yeah. let's remember location of schools. So, yeah, no, if we so, need more in the West, so, it'd be different yeah. if you were talking, uh, you know, further, you know, east uh, over with, with Catonsville or something. Uh, haven't you asked <laughs> us to get creative? So, you know, just to piggyback on, just to piggyback on what um, Mr. Weinstein was saying, and also Ms. Delmont Small, just in terms of maybe where, because I'm very supportive of affordable housing. I think this this conversation is making me about as sad as I've been in a conversation here. I've certainly had strong feelings about it, but this makes me really sad. But I think in terms of them not being mutually exclusive, I think that was a really good point. And I'm looking at the, I know Ms. Dr. Ball didn't want to see maps, because, but I mean, this is the map that was redone with the sort of current information. And my question is, if we as a county support affordable housing, why don't we as a county put money in to building affordable housing where there are, where there are schools, where there are, places to put those kids and to have the, um, that type of education that I know you guys and I know all of us would like to see. Because we're, we're worried up. that these schools, you know, if you look at Talbot Springs, um, you know, you look at the portables, uh, and that is, you know, somewhat of a second-rate type of thing going on there. And uh, it's, it's not fair to our students and families if they're not receiving equitable resources from the, from the county. 
you know, thanks to thing. you, pretty right. soon Talbot Springs will be a new school and maybe even a net zero school. Right, but and, and that's a great so. example because that allowed because when we look at APFO and we're looking at this, we're looking at it as a way to preserve the educational experience of the children, which means that we need flexibility. And part of flexibility that we need as a board of education and as a school system is not only time but also money, and also the ability to have a CIP and say, okay, at one point in time, again, we had a snapshot now. and then move elsewhere. Okay, um, any more questions on affordable housing? Any other questions? Um, I, I know there's been a lot of discussion Wait, on the interim. Bef huh? Before I, I so I heard no other questions on affordable housing. No. I'm going to thank everybody who came to participate in the in the conversation. I know there's some folks who didn't get a chance to speak, but thank you. Um, thanks, Greg Fox. No, just the Anne Arundel County thing has been tossed around a lot today, and I know we've got a lot of emails on it. There's people here who can speak to it, so. I wouldn't mind understanding the differences, you know, in it more apples to apples of the Anne Arundel County. Um, With their legislation that just passed? Yeah, the, the past versus what we're talking about here. If there's anything we can glean from that. And I don't know, is there somebody, there's here, somebody or not? here who can speak to that? Uh, oh, okay. I thought, I thought you know, Cole did, but, huh? Are, are we released? <laughs> I, I, I work on that at your I'd, I'd just be curious to know exactly what they're doing to see if there's anything for us to, to learn from it, too. But So, Mr. Fox, I did ask earlier or last week for our staff to look at what was happening in Anne Arundel County and try to do a comparison for us. Okay. And uh, we got started on it, but it hasn't been finished. So any okay. that that's absolutely I, no, intentional one thing I can add. I did speak to the auditor on Friday at a conference. Do you have some connection to Anne Arundel County? <laughs> and uh, I didn't go to school there, so I can't tell you if I was in any kind of uh, portables or anything. We have a thick Anne Arundel accent. <laughs> <laughs> but they did. But they did put something in there um, that if um, builders want to contribute property or. Um, help towards construction of schools, I think. I, I'm not sure the complete formula. I took a look at it online today, but kind of ran out of time. But did they require, did that require state enabling legislation to set up another fund or process? I do not know. Do you, we do there get, I mean, we have gotten land from developers no, in uh, yeah, our county as well. Sure. So. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, so, but they they had a, it was specifically tied to the new their, legislation, their new, the 95 percent, and and they've actually had um, a school built by a developer before, that sure, was, yeah, seven years we. ago while I was there. But oh, we have. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Mr. Yeah, Greenfield, did you work yeah. on this issue yeah. in, in mm -hmm. Anne Arundel County? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I cover all the bottom area counties, so all this stuff related to affordable housing and all this stuff is land, very much in our wheelhouse. Um, so, Mr. Fox, are you interested in hearing yeah. this? Okay. Re yeah, really, really briefly, um, Anne Arundel County is luckier than Howard County in terms of its mitigation options. They don't have to go to the state for anything. They can raise their fees themselves. They can raise their taxes. and and they could take that mitigation option um, that allowed developers to donate land uh, that was by right at the county council level. It's also important to note that even the sponsor of the bill agreed that it actually didn't do almost anything to fix the problem, so they agreed to sunset the bill in one year. Uh, my and that was when, so on the run sunset? Uh, that was, was that tied to, um, Tied to the fact that they also have planned APFO review. No, they no. have no APFO review mechanism in the county. Oh, no, I'm sorry, it was their general plan. Yeah, general general plan. Kick off their general plan. So no. they were sunsetting. I've got so if, people if behind general, you right, from so our staff the shaking their hands. Yes. General passes before the bill will sunset before, but the right. general plan has no relation to APFO. It no, I was just talking about that specific provision. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Their, the general plan is not an APFO review in any way. Okay. So well, we will, but we'll it, does, it will sunset if the yeah. general plan passes before. They just wanted the bill to end because they're under the same political pressure that everybody else is during elections. Okay. I think, um, think. Ms. Sigety, much like the rest <laughs> of us, want to hear from our staff on the comparison. Correct. And given, yes, I was going thank to you. say that since I've right, already asked for that, um, thank you for your contribution, um, but we will have um, our staff 
try to prepare for us an, an accurate delineation Comparison. of um, yeah. right. So, any other questions? To, not to them, just two comments. One, just the weird, what right. I was. Right. Oh, so, excuse me, just, one second, yes. then. Thank you. Absolutely. Going to uh, Dr. Ball's last comment, what we were saying is, he, I'm just clarifying. It was actually what he was talking about was developers providing property. We haven't had somebody build a school at this point. Correct. So just just want to make sure for anybody who heard that that yep. they didn't take that away from from this well, process. And, and there's nothing so, that, that precludes could. someone from no. giving us land. Right. And but I just wanted to to make sure that people didn't think we've had somebody build one previously. So no, we did. And then the other thing too is again because all these things and cost are moving parts and. Well, you know, I'm in the, the business of energy efficiency and renewable energy. You still have to make sure whatever you're doing is, you know, going to be cost effective on the long term. So, you know, net zero can be might be great if the ongoing energy cost and maintenance cost and everything else are also going to play out during that time. But if it's going to re if it, if it's actually the finance cost differential of of those additional costs are coming out, you know, if we're putting additional capital costs and we can't now get them and now we can can't build as much we got to remember that we're putting that pressure on the school system as well you know if we're sitting there say hey, make sure it's net zero or make sure it's this or make sure it's that you know there's trade-offs with all of it so so mr. Fox I appreciate that you're sharing your expertise <laughs> but I'm back on the two agenda items I, and I, that I, that actually, wasn't one although I do recognize that dr. ball in his I enthusiasm would, opened the door that's all so. I did <laughs> I, I told you I, I you know regardless I would only Respond. Right. I'm not bringing up new things. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, but on the two to on the topic of council bills one and two, are there any more questions? I'm going to close it that way. With that, um, colleagues, we're done. Thank you. Thanks to everybody who was here with us.